Welcome to the Justice Committee's 34th meeting of 2017. Agenda item number one is consideration of four negative instruments and I refer members to paper one which is a note by the clerk. The first instrument is first tier tribunals for Scotland Housing and Property Chamber Procedure Regulations 2017 SSI 2017 oblique 328. Do members have any comments? Liam Kerr. Oh, sorry, Liam MacArthur. I'm looking at Liam MacArthur and saying Liam Kerr. <laughs> that threw me. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. Just looking at the response from the DPLR uh, committee in relation to this uh, amendment, I know we've had issues, as other committees have, with um, drafting errors that subsequently have to be um, tightened up and, and dealt with. But I, I, mean, I can't recall having seen um, a, a comment from the DPLR um, committee or its predecessors um, that went quite as far as to say it's highly unsatisfactory for the instrument to have been laid before Parliament in its present form. The committee's role is not to provide a substitute for internal checking by the relevant Scottish Government uh, Department. The committee urges the government to examine its quality control procedures to avoid laying instruments containing so many errors uh, in future. Um, I, I mean, I recognise that those have subsequently been addressed, but um, I, I think it, it is something that we should lend our support to the, the representations that clearly the DPLR committee have made, because uh, I think this is wholly unsatisfactory. I all agree to do that. It isn't a new issue, and um, as uh, Liam says, it's actually resulting in the government having to um, lay another instrument, so it is something that must be looked at. Um, we keep saying that, but um, at least the DPLR seem to be picking up it and really being very robust on its scrutiny. Um, if there are any no more comments, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed? Okay. The second instrument is the first tier tribunal for Scotland Housing and Property Changer, uh, Chamber Rules of Procedure Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017 oblique 369. Do members have any comments? No comments. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Agreed. The third instrument is the first tier for Scotland, the first tier tribunal for Scotland, General Regulatory Chamber Charity Appeals Procedure Regulations 2017 SSI 2017 oblique 364. Uh, do members have any comments? No comments. Is committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. And the fourth instrument is the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland Health and Education Chamber Procedure Regulations 2017, SSI 2017, oblique 366. Do members have any comments? Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. We will suspend um, briefly to allow the Minister um, to, to come in. Agenda item two is consideration of two affirmative instruments, Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, Consequential and Supplementary Modifications, Regulations 2017 Draft, and Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, Modification of Part 1 and Ancillary Provision, Regulations 2017 Draft. And I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials Stephen Tidy, Police Powers Team, Scottish Government, and Louise Miller, Directorate of Legal Services um, for the Scottish Government. I refer members to Paper 2, which is a note by, um, by the clerk. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to make a short opening statement? Uh, 
Thank you, Convener. I hope it will help if I can briefly explain the purpose and effect of these instruments. I begin with the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 modification of Part 1 and auxiliary provision regulations. Uh, Part 1 of the Act represent, represents a significant change to the system of arrest and holding people in custody. The new arrest and custody processes contained within Part 1 will provide a clear balance between the proper investigation of offences and the prospect and the protection of suspects' rights whilst in police custody. Whilst the majority of arrests are of people suspected of criminal offences, the police have powers to arrest for other reasons not related to a criminal offence. For example, an arrest for a breach of a protective court order or a witness arrested under warrant for failing to attend court. For these types of arrests, not all of the provisions set out in the Act are appropriate. For example, it, would, it wouldn't be appropriate to take a witness arrested for failing to appear at court to a police station, rather than directly to the court itself. Similarly, the requirement to tell someone uh, the offence that they have been arrested for clearly does not make sense for arrests which do not relate to an offence. For this reason, as I have set out during the passage, as I set out during the passage of the bill, some limited modifications to the arrest provisions are needed for non-offence-based arrests. The modifications made by the regulations will ensure that individuals in these situations are dealt with appropriately. For example, by requiring them to be told the reason for their arrest rather than the offence for which they have been or they are suspected and by disapplying the provisions that allow people to be held in investigative custody where the person is not being held on suspicion of an offence. The regulations will also ensure that people arrested for breaches of protective orders will continue to be brought before the courts under specialist provisions which apply to those, rather than under Section 21 of the 2016 Act. They will also ensure that where rights given to everyone in police custody under Part 1 of the 2016 Act will apply, all provisions which partially duplicate these in relation to particular types of non-offence arrests are removed. For the information of the committee, a full public consultation was carried out in relation to these regulations and a draft of the regulations was included in the consultation. Although the consultation only received a small number of responses, it was positively commented on by various interest groups, including the Law Society and Scottish Women's Aid. I now turn to the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 Consequential and Supplementary Modifications Regulations. These mainly technical amendments which are consequential to the 2016 Act. For example, they formally repeal all powers of arrest which are abolished by Section 54 of the Act. They also remove statutory reference to detention under Section 14 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, which is abolished by the 2016 Act. Paragraph 12.3 of the schedule adds the Sheriff Appeal Court to the list of criminal courts in respect of which the Lord Justice General may make directions enabling certain appearances of an accused to be by live television link. All the other criminal courts, the High Court, Sheriff Court and Justice of the Peace Courts are already included on the list. The mission of the Sheriff Appeal Court is purely down to timing as the bill which became at the 2016 Act was introduced before the bill which established the Sheriff Appeal Court. The amendment therefore plugs a gap in the provisions relating to live links. This gives a very brief overview of the regulations and their context and I'm of course happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Do members have any questions or comments on, on the SSIs? No. Okay, that being the case, then we'll move to agenda item three, which is formal consideration of the motions in relation to the affirmative instruments. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on these instruments and has no comment 
on it. The motions will be moved with an opportunity for formal debate um, if that's necessary. The motion is motion 08837 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 consequential and supplementary modifications regulations 2017 draft be approved. Um, Cabinet Secretary, can you move the motion? Moved. Thank you. Do members have any comments? No comments. The question is that motion 08837, in the name of Michael Matheson, be approved. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are agreed. The second motion is motion 08838, that the Justice Committee recommends that the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 modification of Part 1 and ancillary provision regulations 2017 draft be approved. Um, Cabinet Secretary, will you move the motion? Moved. Do members have any comments? No comments. I put the question, therefore, that motion 08838 in the name of Michael Masson be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Is the committee content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft report? Yeah. That being the case, I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending and suspend briefly to allow for a change of officials. Agenda item four is consideration of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill at stage two. I refer members to their copy of the bill and the marshalled list of amendments for this item. And I welcome back the Cabinet Secretary and his officials. Um, also Lin uh, welcome Linda Fabiani to, to the meeting. Right, the marshalled list. Um, section one, relationship context of offence. And I call amendment number one in my name, grouped with amendment two. I move the amendment and now speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, these amendments were prompted by evidence the committee heard from Scottish Women's Aid at stage one when Heather Williams, giving an example of psychological abuse, stated, if I meet you in a shop and say, I notice your son's got a new bike, I hope he doesn't have an accident, that might appear to be a reasonable conversation. However, it could set off a lot of distress if, in the context of the relationship, you're threatening me and saying that I, if I leave or do anything that you're not happy with, you will hurt my son. When taken in full context, we can understand why it would cause harm and distress. This evidence I consider to be absolutely crucial, as it seems to me that in order to understand and recognise whether behaviour is deemed to be abusive or likely to cause someone to suffer psychological harm within a domestic relationship, then it's absolutely essential this behaviour is looked at within the context of that relationship. In some circumstances, behaviour may not appear to be threatening or intimidating. However, once the context of the relationship between A and B is taken into account, the behaviour may be seen as in an entirely different light. Amendments 1 and 2, which have the support of Scottish Women's Aid, therefore insert in the context of the relationship between A and B into section one of the bill. And I've already moved the amendments in my name. Do members have any comments on these two amendments? 
No comments. Move straight to the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Amendment 1 and 2 relate to the new offence of domestic abuse and are, as I understand it, intended to address an apparent concern that has been raised during Stage 1 scrutiny. That concern is that the operation of the offence does not acknowledge that relationships between partners are, by their nature, different, and so behaviour occurring within the context of one relationship may be construed quite differently than the same or similar behaviour occurring within another different relationship. While I can see the amendments are obviously well-intentioned, I'd like to explain why I do not think they are required and indeed may confuse how the courts should be approaching consideration of the new offence. First, I'd like to briefly confirm how the new offence operates so as to explain in context why the amendments are not necessary. It's clear already in the wording of section one that the offence concerns a course of abusive behaviour within the context of a relationship between a person and their partner or ex-partner. It is important to consider the definition of abusive behaviour at section two. This provides that behaviour which is abusive includes behaviour which is violent, threatening or intimidating and it's hard to imagine any circumstances when such behaviour would not be abusive. So the amendments are unnecessary in relation to these aspects of abusive behaviour. However, as members know, the definition of abusive behaviour also includes behaviour that is likely to have one of the effects on the complainer as listed at section 2.3. It is important to keep in mind that the question here is whether the accused's behaviour is likely to have one of these effects on the actual complainer in the case, as opposed to a hypothetical person. This means that the court is required, uh, case by case, to have regard to the context of the relationship between the accused and the complainer in reaching its decision on the evidence. For example, where the accused's behaviour was likely to have the effect of frightening, humiliating, degrading or punishing the particular complainer in question. It is also important to bear in mind that the court is required to consider whether a reasonable person would consider the accused's behaviour is likely to cause the complainer to suffer physical or psychological harm and not whether it would be likely to cause a hypothetical victim to suffer such harm. Let me give the committee an example. If the court accepts evidence that the relationship between the accused and the complainer was characterised by, for example, being very argumentative and use of strong language by both parents, both partners, eh, that eh, others might consider abusive in a general sense, the court may reach the conclusion that, given the context of the relationship between the accused and the complainer, the accused behaviour was not likely to cause psychological harm to the complainer. Again, this turns on the likely effect on the particular complainer in question rather than a hypothetical victim. Nevertheless, this depends on what the court believes a reasonable person would conclude as likely to affect the complainer in question. This ensures the right measures of objectivity too as the evidence is assessed case by case. I hope this provides reassurance that the bill, as introduced, requires the court to have regard to the whole context of the relationship between the accused and the complainer in deciding whether it provides that the offence is committed. Happy to give way to the member. Thank yes, you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, if, if your examples have all related to interpretation by the court, but of course there's a step prior to that, and that is the involvement in the police in any instance. And the particular phrase that the convener used, where you or I to use it to someone, be seen as very innocent. The difficulty is perhaps that uh, a, victim, a woman who's the victim of such an approach may have difficulty convincing the police that this is something that's unreasonable. Is that not what the challenge is? It's not the court's interpretation. It's actually getting the issue to court. 
No, not necessarily, because in relation to the legislation that will be applied, it will be for the courts to decide on how that is to be interpreted. And that's why the balance within the actual offence is set out in the way in which it has within the bill, so that the whole context of the relationship is taken into account in considering the matter. Well, I finish what I've got to say on the rest of the, the amendments. Uh, so, amendments reiterate, so the amendments uh, reiterating that the offence takes place within the context of a relationship between partner or ex-partner are simply not needed. Let me make some further brief points on the amendments. The addition of the words in the context of the relationship between A and B in two places within section 1 adds no true legal effect to what is already addressed by the provisions when read as a whole. I'm also concerned that the additional words are liable to cause confusion. Indeed, I'm not quite sure precisely what, words the, addi what the additional wording being added are truly qualifying in each place. The amendments also perhaps beg the question, when would abusive behaviour between partners and ex-partners not be in the context of the relationship? Would it ever be possible to separate out uh, relationship abuse from non-relationship abuse when abuse is occurring between people who have a continuing relationship or once had a relationship? Finally, if the convener is intending to provide for an objective overview of what is reasonable in a typical relationship context between two hypothetical people, the amendments do not achieve that. This is because they refer to the particular relationship between person A and person B. In any event, the nature of what amounts to abusive behaviour within the context of a particular relationship is already covered, as I have explained. In addition, it's worth reminding members that the defence in Section 5 of the Bill is part of the checks and balances designed to ensure no one is unfairly criminalised by the new offence. On that basis, and in these comments, I would invite the member to withdraw Amendment 1 and not to move Amendment 2. Um, I can't the Cabinet Secretary for these comments. Can I take his last um, point <laughs> first, perhaps, that it's likely to, to cause confusion? You can't imagine what relationship. The type of relationship we're looking at here is an abusive one with the issue of psychological harm, which can be quite hard for people to get their, hand, uh, their head around. There are two types of relationships, non-abusive, and those that the legislation seeks to address. And that's where the context um, is all important and I think greatly adds to the understanding of the bill. In all your explanations, Cabinet Secretary, you've mentioned context constantly, yet it isn't on the face of the bill. This amendment merely serves to make this legislation the best it can possibly be and to aid the understanding of psychological abuse, which I think, by referring to context, suddenly makes it quite clear and makes it totally evident what actually is psychological behaviour. And I'm going to ask you, Cabinet <coughs> Secretary, to reflect on that before. And I'll give an example on the trafficking bill where we constantly asked for amendments on it and at stage three eventually we got these amendments for the very purpose of strengthening and making the bill a better bill. So I'm not going to move these, but I would very much welcome further discussion with them to see if we can um, come to a meeting of minds because for, for me, context is all important to making sure that this bill is going to achieve what we all desperately want to, to see it achieving. And can I just say to them that having had a very lengthy discussion with Women's Aid who brought this evidence up, they are very much of the same opinion. So if the Minister, um, the Cabinet Secretary, is happy to discuss the issue for, further with me, I won't press the amendment at this stage. I'm always happy to discuss matters with the committee members in relation to looking to improve legislation. Uh, however, uh, the nature of the discussions we've had with Scottish Women's Aid is slightly different from those that the member expresses, but I'm more than happy to have a discussion with her before stage three. The Cabinet Secretary that I've had the same discussion as, um, as early as what, half an hour before we came into to committee. So um, there's obviously some miss in communication. Right, with that, I will not press the amendment and therefore...
content to accept your amendment? Is the committee uh, content to accept that I withdraw amendment number one? Content, yeah. Thank you. And call amendment number two in my name, already debated and not moved. Is the committee content to we're accept we're that it is moved? Thank you. Um, right, the question is that section one be agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is that section two be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. Right, moving on to um, extraterritorial jurisdiction. Call amendment three in the name of the cabinet secretary and a group on its own. Cabinet secretary to move and speak to amendment three. Amendment three inserts a new section into the bill which provides the Scottish courts with extraterritorial jurisdiction in respect of offences of domestic abuse. Members will recall that this issue was raised by Scottish Women's Aid in their evidence at stage one. They emphasised that, in their view, it was necessary to provide Scottish courts with extraterritorial jurisdiction over the domestic abuse offence to comply with the Istanbul Convention on Violence Against Women. The effect of our amendment is to provide that where a UK national or a habitual Scottish resident commits the offence wholly or partly, outside the United Kingdom, the Scottish courts have jurisdiction to deal with the offence. This is particularly important given that the offence is constituted by a course of behaviour that can occur over time in various places. The amendment also provides for which Sheriff Court is to have jurisdiction if the offence is committed wholly outside the United Kingdom. Existing jurisdictional rules uh, will apply where the offence is committed partly abroad and partly within Scotland. Simply put, the offence can be tried in a Sheriff Court district where the Scottish part of the course of conduct took place. The amendment does not make provision where the offence is committed in other jurisdictions of the UK. This is because where an offence occurs partly in another jurisdiction of the UK, there are common law rules concerning offences committed across the different jurisdictions of the UK that will enable these elements of a course of conduct which happens in another part of the UK to be included in the charge. For the avoidance of doubt, where the behaviour occurs wholly in other, another jurisdiction of the UK, we think it appropriate that it should be prosecuted in a court in that jurisdiction. And I move Amendment 3. OK, do members have any comments? Perhaps I could ask the Cabinet Secretary for an example of the, the kind of uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction um, behaviour that might be covered by this amendment. Well, it could be, for example, uh, say for a, 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 a partner or a, a, a couple were in holiday in Spain uh, and a course of abusive behaviour took place there. Uh, they then returned back to Scotland and when they, uh, they, they made a complaint to the police that was being investigated, they made reference to the behaviour that took place which occurred out with uh, Scotland. In that case, it would be allowed to be, they could then take it into account when they were uh, considering the complaint and um, how that would then be presented within court. And the, the, the jurisdiction would um, be worldwide? In what sense? Well, how, how, where, where are we looking? Extraterritorial jurisdiction? Yeah, it, does, it does, doesn't have to. It could be anywhere in the world where that course of behaviour happened. It doesn't okay. matter where it happens if it's out with, uh, if it's out with the, uh, Scotland uh, or the UK. Okay. Um, so it's, it's not specific to any particular country. Yeah, you, you mentioned a country that was in, within the EU. That was, that was all I was asking about. Any other yeah. comments from... This is not dependent on whether we remain within the EU or not. Well, that's good to know. We'll have an secretary. Of course, Name it's Istanbul, <laughs> uh, which is not part of the EU. So. Good morning. I, I just have a slight concern about the status of A, uh, the, the, the perpetrator. So we, we've set out two categories. Uh, we have habitually resident in Scotland or a UK national. Uh, now, I completely accept that there needs to be a, a very real connection to Scotland, and so I, I'm perfectly comfortable with the habitually resident in Scotland piece. However, I, it's my understanding, and I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, Cabinet Secretary, that the modern statutes tend, if, if there's a nationality category at all, to limit it to British citizens. In other words, not the slightly wider definition of UK national that is uh, in this, the British Overseas Territory Citizen 
British national uh, or overseas citizen. Uh, so certainly my view would be that the best option is just to, to narrow this down to, the, to those habitually resident in Scotland at the time of committing the offence, uh, with a caveat that uh, if it's going to be wider, it should just be British citizens. Uh, and I would just be interested in your thoughts on that. So my understanding is that in order to comply with the Convention, it uh, has to apply to those who are habitual resident within the UK or UK nationals. And that's the reason why it's been drafted in the way in which it is in order to comply with the requirements of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, I see, and that, and that would include the... So, so you've said habitually resident and British nationals and, and... UK nationals. UK nationals, and to comply with the Convention, that's why it needs to include the overseas territories yes. citizen. I understand. Thank you. OK. And Liam MacArthur? Just following that up and for the... For the, the purposes of, of clarity, um, in terms of that jurisdiction, if you're talking about a, a UK national as, as defined here, um, they may not be um, habitually resident in Scotland as, as um, subsection 3A refers to um, habitually resident in Scotland or as a UK national. We're not dealing with circumstances where somebody who is a UK national but resides habitually somewhere else in the UK commits the offence overseas either in whole or in part, and then is subject to the jurisdiction of sheriff courts in, in Scotland. How, how is that um, delineated through, through this provision? I'm sorry, I'm not entirely with you. Well, well, a, UK, sort of a, a you UK national, to... somebody who's habitually um, a resident somewhere else in the, in the UK, who commits the, the offence overseas, um, either uh, entirely overseas or, or, or partly overseas, returns to the UK, finds themselves um, uh, subject to, to a complaint. So if it's, if, it's, if it's a UK national that commits the course of offence uh, entirely out with the UK, mm -hmm. then that can still be prosecuted within Scottish courts. If it is a UK national who's committed, I'm not, if I'm just trying to clarify mm -hmm. this for the member, if it's a UK national that commits the majority of that offence in another part of the UK out with the Scottish jurisdiction, and as I said, out, then yeah. it would be prosecuted through the domestic courts where the no, majority sir, I'm of that... I'm probably not explaining this clearly. It, it was more in relation to that first um, example. You have a UK national who commits the offence um, overseas and, and, and the entire um, sequence of, of, uh, of action takes place overseas. But that UK national is not habitually resident in Scotland. Presumably this provision isn't about prosecuting an individual from, I don't know, Manchester or London or wherever in Scottish Sheriff Courts? No, they could, if, if it was, for example, if it's someone who was, say, for example, an expat staying overseas, um, who committed offence against someone who resided here in Scotland, and that was their habitual residence here in Scotland, then they could be prosecuted here in Scotland for that offence. Right. OK. If, that's, if that clarifies the type of person he was thinking about. OK, that's helpful. Any more comments? Um, this has been more of a Q&A uh, because it's a technical point. <laughs> Normally we would take all the, the comments uh, in a one -er and then ask for the Cabinet Secretary's view. Anything you, further you want to, to say, Cabinet Secretary, in winding up? No, that's all. OK, the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, the question is that Section 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Aggravation in relation to a child, call Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 4 and speak to all amendments in the group. It, members will be aware that the Bill contains a statutory aggravation in Section 4. This aggravation provides that if the accused in committing the offence involves a child in committing the offence, then aggravation applies. A child can be involved in three ways. The accused directly, uh, directed behaviour at the child. The accused made, us, made use of a child in directing behaviour at their partner or ex-partner. And a child saw, heard or was present during incidents of behaviour, forming part of the course of abusive behaviour, which constitutes the offence. The aggravation is intended to ensure that the harm caused to the children uh, when they witnessed or, in, uh, or are involved uh, by the perpetrator in the abuse can be reflected by the court 
when sentencing the perpetrator. Members have heard stakeholders representing children affected by domestic abuse express some concern that the aggravation uh, as it stands in the bill does not reflect the harm caused to children by, grown, by growing up in an environment uh, where their parent or carer is being abused. This criticism has focused on those types of cases where a child is in the environment where the abusive behaviour is being carried out, but is not directly involved as such, and so the current aggravation would not apply. Examples of the kinds of harmful effect of domestic abuse on children that are not covered by the aggravation at present include coercive and controlling behaviour, which has the effect of isolating a child, as well as the primary victim from, from friends, family or other sources of support, or abusive behaviour that undermines the non-abusing parent or carer's ability to look after the child, for example, by restricting their access to transport, limiting their ability to get a child to a doctor's appointment, or restricting their access to money, limiting their ability to provide essentials for a child, or the harm caused when a child is unaware that the abuse is taking place, even though they never see it, hear, or are present when the abusive behaviour is taking place. The Stage 1 report uh, noted these concerns and asked the Scottish Government to respond to evidence that the reference in the current approach to the aggravation being established where a child sees or hears or is present during an incident of abusive behaviour, which uh, was too narrow. It was argued in this evidence that children in the care of victims of abuse are likely to suffer trauma as a result of that abuse whether or not they directly witnessed abusive behaviour or abusive incidents, and that there is therefore an aggravation. Amendment 4 to 9 responds to these concerns by widening the scope of the aggravation. Amendment 5 provides that in addition to the existing ways in which the offence can be aggravated, the offence is also aggravated if a reasonable person would consider that the perpetrator's course of behaviour or an incident that forms part of that course of behaviour is likely to cause a child who usually resides with the victim or the perpetrator to be adversely affected. Amendment 9 adds to this by providing that reference to a child being adversely affected in, include causing the child to suffer fear, alarm or distress. This is a non-exhaustive def definition, so other ways in which a child is adversely affected could be taken into account if the court is satisfied by the evidence in a particular case. For example, if a perpetrator controls a victim's movement to such an extent that they are unable to leave the house to ensure their ch children get to school or to get them to a doctor's appointment, the court could determine that this could amount to behaviour likely to adversely affect a child. As with other aggravations, uh, evidence from a single source is sufficient for the aggravation to be proven. This is provided for in section 4 already. The aggravation uses a reasonable person test, so there is no requirement for the prosecution to prove that the child was actually adversely affected, providing the court, provided the court is satisfied that a reasonable person would consider it likely that the child would be adversely affected by the perpetrator's actions. The aggravation is limited to children who usually reside with the victim or the perpetrator. This reflects the feedback that it is living in an environment where domestic abuse is perpetrated that can most adversely affect a child. Amendment 4 paves the way for Amendment 5. At the two current limbs of the aggravation will accordingly be split between the present section 2 and a new subsection to A, to sit alongside the new subsection to B in Amendment 5. Amendment 6 to 8 are technical and are really just for the avoidance of doubt in the operation of the aggravation as a whole. Amendment 6 provides that it is not necessary to prove that a child had witnessed, uh, had awareness of the accused behaviour, uh, understood the nature of the accused behaviour or was adversely affected by the accused behaviour for the aggravation to be proven. Amendment 7 ensures that the three limbs of the aggravation are capable of being applied separately, 
but that they can also be used in combination with each other where more than one applies in a particular case. Amendment 8 ensures that nothing in the formulation of the aggravation prevents evidence from being led on certain impacts on a child, even though such impacts on a child are not essential to prove the aggravation. And I move Amendment 4. Thank you. Do members have any comments? Uh, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thanks, uh, Convener. Can I start by warmly welcoming uh, the amendments in this uh, section? As the Cabinet Secretary has rightly said, it does address a concern we heard um, uh, from a number of, uh, of witnesses at, at stage one in so far as the aggravation being uh, limited to, the, to, to children who had heard or seen um, uh, abuse taking place uh, didn't give, um, I think, effect to the, the full range uh, of the, the, the effects that uh, uh, abusive behaviour can have within a, within a household and, and, and children within that household. I suppose the one question I had was in relation to um, Amendment uh, 6, and you touched on this, uh, Cabinet Secretary, in your, in your comments, um, but this allows for a, an aggravation in circumstances where there is no evidence uh, a child has been adversely affected uh, by a perpetrator's uh, behaviour. And I can understand understand why the provisions there, you touched on the, the reasonableness uh, test. I wonder whether uh, there needs to be a reference made to perhaps recklessness on the part of, of the, the perpetrator. I mean, even with the, the best of intentions, I suppose we'd, we need to be clear we're not setting the parameters of any offence um, uh, too, too broadly. Um, but it may well be that I'm, I'm, I'm missing an aspect of the way that this uh, amendment um, is to be read or interrelates with, with other parts of the, the bill. So just would welcome uh, any comments uh, on that, particularly on that, that, that point in relation to um, recklessness of, of, of a perpetrator's behaviour. Largely be in the Comes, anyone else got comments? We're, we're having the formal debate now and we'll bring the Cabinet Secretary in once everyone's had their, their say. Liam Kerr? Uh, just to, to, to take Liam MacArthur's point and echo everything he says, um, I had, had a slight concern when I was looking at this. I, I'm going to argue against myself, Cabinet Secretary. So, uh, but in the, section, in the Amendment 6, you talk about uh, the child not necessarily ever having any awareness of... A's behaviour, and uh, I did have an initial concern that uh, we end up setting up an aggravator where uh, there's almost a hypothetical child uh, who, who can know nothing and yet aggravate the offence. Uh, but now I'll argue against myself because I was also going to bring in an Amendment 5, the part about usually residing with A or B, and is this unnecessarily restrictive uh, on the offence? But presumably you will counter-argue that by putting in the residence criteria, that's why the awareness becomes acceptable. Mm -hmm. I'll throw that up uh -huh. just as so, all. Uh, just before <laughs> we finish the debate, because we should get all the comments first, anyone else want to comment on that? Can I just say, um, uh, Amendment 6, I had similar kind of concerns to, to Liam MacArthur, but I, I, I think the, the one thing I'd see reassurance on those that it is ECHR compliant, and I did understand that perhaps the, the purpose of the amendment was to catch children who, although they haven't an awareness or an understanding or are, um, been affected, are potentially at risk. So that was my understanding. Any more comments? If not, Cabinet Secretary. Okay, thank you, Convener, and I'm uh, grateful to the comments made by members. Can I deal with uh, Liam MacArthur's point, first of all, and the reason uh, that we have set it out in this way is because it's dealing with the aggravation rather than the offence in itself, uh, and that's why we've set it out uh, within the, with Amendment 6 in the way in which we, uh, which we have. So the offence deals with issues such as recklessness in itself, um, uh, but the aggravation is about, um, uh, about the impact that it can actually have on... Uh, the child uh, that may be affected by this behaviour. Which takes me to uh, Liam Kerr's point, who answered his own question in the course of his question uh, to me, because they are both interrelated uh, in that they uh, would normally be resident with the perpetrator or the, uh, or the uh, complainer in these particular uh, cases. Um, the other part to this is that um, in relation to the reasonable person test, you could, for example, have a, a, a baby um, that's one or two years old, uh, that may have no understanding of the impact that the abusive relationship is having on their parent who's unable to take them to the doctor. 
uh, for, a, for an appointment for, uh, for any good reason. Uh, and that's where the reasonable person test then kicks in so that the court can then consider well, and a reasonable person would assume that that actually would have an adverse impact on the child. So that's the reason why um, we've applied, the, again, uh, the provision within Amendment 6 to uh, make sure that the reasonable person test is applied in testing this at the time when the court is considering it. Right, thank you for that. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We're all agreed. Call Amendment 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, all previously debated. Invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 5 to 9 on block. Moved. Okay. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 5 to 9? No, no objection. Um, if no member objects, the question is that amendments 5 to 9 are agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. The question is that section 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed? The question is that section 5 to 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Um, now turning to restriction on bail and solemn cases, call amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with amendment 11. Cabinet Secretary to move amendment 10 and speak to both amendments in the group. Amendment 10 and 11 are important additions to the protection this bill offers to victims of domestic abuse. They are consistent with the approach taken elsewhere in the bill, where we have extended protections already offered by our legal system to the victims of sexual offences, to the victims of domestic abuse and related offences as well. At present, in solemn proceedings, where an individual is accused of violent or sexual offences, and where that individual has been convicted on indictment of sexual or violent offences, Bail is to be granted only in exceptional circumstances. Uh, this is under Section 23D of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. We want to ensure the availability of bail for uh, uh, repeat offenders accused of domestic abuse is limited in a similar fashion. We also want to ensure that the link between domestic abuse offences and sexual or violent offences, which we have made elsewhere in the bill, are made here as well. Amendment 11 is the main amendment which constructs a group of offences including violent offences, sexual offences and domestic abuse offences. The effect of Amendment 11 is that where an individual is accused in solemn proceedings of any violent or sexual or domestic abuse offences and had been convicted in the past of any violent or sexual or domestic abuse offences, bail would be granted only in exceptional circumstances. Domestic abuse offences here include uh, both the new offence of domestic abuse in this bill and any offence charged where the domestic abuse aggravation contained in the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Act 2016 have been attached. When an accused is accused in solemn proceedings of an offence of any of these kinds and has been convicted on indictment of an offence of any of these kinds, bail is to be granted by the court only if there are exceptional circumstances to justify it. This includes previous convictions for equivalent offences in other parts of the UK and in the rest of the EU. Amendment 10 adds reference to these changes into the list of procedural changes we are making to this bill. And I move Amendment 10. Okay. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Do members have any comments or questions? Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. I, I just throw up the possibility. It, it seems to me that there's a possibility here that we end up tying the hands of the court uh, in circumstances which perhaps have little prospect uh, uh, or where there's little evidence of guilt. And I just wonder aloud whether there's a, a human rights angle to that or whether it would fall foul of any human rights issues. Any other comments from members? Okay, Cabinet Secretary, wind up. Um, it, well, that's the reason why we give the scope for um, uh, the court to determine any exceptional circumstances, not for the court to determine that at a, a given time uh, in what um, is presented to it. Uh, the member made reference to about any human rights aspect to it. The member will be also aware that the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights has been very clear about the need to make sure that the courts have the final say in matters relating to bail. 
uh, and that they must have discretion in making decisions relating to bail. Uh, and this amendment continues to ensure that will be the case. So we're confident that it complies with the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights in these matters uh, by making the provision for exceptional circumstances. Okay. Um, the question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. The question is that Section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 10. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 14 in the name of Marie Goujon, grouped with Amendment 15 to 25. Um, can I point out if Amendments 18, 19 and 20, eh, these are preempted by Amendment 31, the group mandatory non-harassment orders. And if Amendment 24 is agreed, then I cannot call Amendment 23 in this group because of the preemption. Mary Gujon to move Amendment 14 and speak to all the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, amendments 14, 15, 16, 19, 21 and 24 are key amendments that I believe will further improve and strengthen the bill by increasing the protections that are afforded to children affected by domestic abuse. And I'm pleased to have lodged these amendments which relate to issues that both I and other members of the committee have raised during our stage one scrutiny. And I would like to thank Assist Children First, Bernardo's, the NSPCC and uh, uh, and other stakeholders for raising these, these issues with the committee and with the Scottish Government too and thank them for their briefings and the support that they've given this amendment, uh, these group of amendments. Amendment 16 is the main amendment. It provides that certain children can benefit from the protections of a non-harassment order in a way that they cannot under current legislation because at the moment an NHO is available as a disposal to a criminal, criminal court following conviction. The court can impose such an order for offences involving misconduct towards another person, and that's namely the victim. An NHO can therefore only be made in respect of victims of an offence. While it is absolutely the case that children, as we've heard through the scrutiny of the bill, are victims of domestic abuse, the bill as currently drafted doesn't recognise that in the relation to the granting of NHOs. So under criminal law and as NHOs currently operate, children would generally not be classed as victims of domestic abuse offending for the purposes of consideration of imposition of an NHO. Amendment 16 and the other associated amendments would change that. The benefit of these amendments will be that the children who are residing with the perpetrator of the domestic abuse and children residing with the partner or ex-partner who has been abused can receive the protection of an NHO. Any child who is the subject of the child aggravation in section four of the bill will also be able to get, be given the protection of an NHO. And this particular aspect does not depend on where the child lives. This will be in addition to the court having to consider whether to make an NHO in respect of the partner or ex-partner. It will of course be for the court to consider and decide in any given case whether to impose an NHO, but Amendment 16 will empower our courts for the first time to be able to impose an NHO for a child harmed by domestic abuse offending in a criminal court. Amendment 19 is a consequential amendment on Amendment 16 and provides for a requirement on the court for an explanation as to why uh, it has or has not imposed an NHO in respect of children in any given case. Amendment 15 is a restating of some material already provided for in the bill, but with the addition of the necessary definition of a child. And that makes the provisions as a whole unfold better in light of Amendment 19. Amendments 14 and 24 are consequential on Amendment 15, and Amendment 21 is a technical amendment removing a word that is no longer useful. I know that Liam MacArthur has lodged amendments which are similar to my own, but I do think that the amendments I've put forward uh, really strengthen uh, and are, are more powerful in the sense that they provide the protections of NHOs to be available for a wider range of children. And in particular, NHOs will be available for children usually residing with the perpetrator of the abuse or the victim of the abuse through my amendments, uh, which I don't think is the case with the amendments of Liam MacArthur. Um, so I really would 
encourage members of the committee to support my amendments to help achieve what I think is our common policy goal, and that's namely the better protection for children affected by domestic abuse. And I move Amendment 14. Right, thank you. Lee MacArthur to speak to Amendment 17 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I thank um, Mary Goujon for her comments in relation to our amendments. Um, she and I were left commiserating uh, together last week as we lost out in the community MSP uh, category of the Politician of the Year Awards. I am delighted, however, that we've shown great fortitude, picked ourselves up, dusted ourselves off and joined forces uh, in trying to improve the bill in relation to the protection it affords uh, children affected by domestic abuse. And I think I would also pay tribute um, to the organisations referred to by Marie Guizot in her uh, comments. In effect, uh, my amendments 17, 18, 20, 22 and 23 seek to ensure uh, that where an offence of domestic abuse is found to have been aggravated by the presence of a child or children, this must be taken into account by the court specifically in its consideration of an NHO. Uh, this is in keeping, as I say, with the evidence that we heard throughout uh, stage one and seems to be, I think, the only reasonable response uh, for the committee to take in such circumstances. In relation to Amendment 25, uh, like those uh, lodged by Mary, provides an alternative means of achieving the same outcome, though giving, through giving uh, ministers an order-making power. Uh, ultimately, I'm entirely relaxed about how the committee choose to go about uh, addressing this gap in the current bill, uh, but look forward to us doing just that, as well as uh, to the comments from the minister and uh, colleagues in relation to these amendments. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Do members have any comments or questions? If not, then Cabinet Secretary. Amendment 14, 15, 16, 19, 21 and 24 in the name of Mary Goujon are important amendments that will further improve the protections afforded to children affected by domestic abuse within this bill. As the member has indicated, uh, this set of amendments will provide the, that children can benefit from the protections of non-harassment orders in a way that they cannot under present legislation. We know that children are too often the victims of domestic abuse too, and while this bill is largely focused on domestic abuse between partner and ex-partners, stakeholders indicated that the fact that non-harassment order provisions in this bill would not extend to children was unfortunate. The benefits of these amendments will be that children residing with the perpetrator of the domestic abuse and children residing with the partner or ex-partner who has been abused can receive the protection of a non-harassment order. Any child who is the subject of the child aggravation in section four of the bill can also be given the protection of a non-harassment order. This particular aspect does not depend on whether the where the child lives. This will be in addition to the court having to consider whether to make a non-harassment order in respect of the ex-partner or partner. Without these amendments, it would be necessary for applications to be made through the civil courts if non-harassment orders were to be considered for the children covered by these amendments. These amendments will therefore reduce the trauma and inconvenience for families affected by domestic abuse and ensure a criminal court can consider whether protections are needed for children affected by domestic abuse. The Scottish Government is pleased these amendments have been brought forward and asks the committee to vote for them into the bill. Turning now to Liam MacArthur's amendments, I have considerable sympathy uh, for what he is seeking to achieve with many of them. However, I will explain why I think the amendments lodged in the name of Mary Goujon are preferable. As I have indicated, uh, Mary Goujon's amendments uh, will mean that non-harassment orders will be available more widely in respect of children in the following ways. Children residing uh, with the perpetrator of the domestic abuse, children residing with the partner or ex-partner who has been abused and children involved in the committal of the abuse by being subject of the child aggravation in section four of the bill. Liam MacArthur's amendments only cover children who are subject to the aggravation in section four of the bill and so in our view do not go far enough. Separately, Amendment 25 seeks to provide an order-making power for, Scot for the Scottish Ministers to make further provisions about non-harassment orders. It is limited uh, to circumstances which affect cases where the statutory child aggravation in Section 4 has been proven, and the amendment provides that regulations may provide for circumstances in which the court must consider making a non-harassment order in order to protect a child. While well, we can understand the intent that lies behind this particular amendment, 
it does seek to provide the Scottish ministers with a wide power to, in effect, legislate by regulation so as to require certain sentencing decisions to be imposed by the court in a given case. The Scottish Government supports judicial discretion as judges hear all the facts and circumstances of a case before a decision is made on sentencing. So, as a matter of general policy, the Scottish Government is not supportive of seeking to remove judicial discretion in the manner suggested by this enabling power. In addition, if the Scottish Parliament were to legislate to remove judicial discretion to determine sentencing decisions on the basis of the facts and circumstances of a given case, then we consider that that should be done on the face of the bill rather than through secondary legislation. We consider it is not a step that should be taken lightly and full parliamentary consideration should be given. On this basis, uh, we would ask Liam MacArthur not to move his amendments 17, 18, 20, 22, 23 and 25 and for the committee to support amendments 14, 15, 16, 19, 21 and 24 in Marie Goujon's name. Thank you. Uh, Marie Goujon to wind up. Press or withdraw. Sorry, press or withdraw. Any comments you want to make and just wind uh, up? No further comments. I just yeah. press the amendments. Thank, Thank you. you. Call amendment. Uh, the question is that amendment 14 be agreed to or are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. Call amendment 15 in the name of Marie Goujon already debated with amendment 14. Marie Goujon to move or not move? Move. Move. Thank you. Uh, the question is that amendment 15 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Call amendment 16 in the name of Marie Goujon, already debated with amendment 14. Marie Goujon to move or not move? Move. Move. Uh, the question is that amendment 16 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call amendment 29 in the name of Linda Fabiami, grouped with amendment 30 to 36. If amendment 31 is agreed to, I cannot call amendments. 18, 19 and 20 already debated in group non-harassment orders as to children as it's a preemption. Linda Fabiani to move amendment 29 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank, <coughs> excuse me, thank you very much convener. Uh, I come to uh, move amendment 29 and uh, the consequential amendments um, from a background of many years of uh, dealing um, with victims of domestic abuse who feel they have been let down by the courts by the non-granting of a non-harassment order. Um, certainly, uh, I can understand that position because it's been backed up by written parliamentary questions over the years where there certainly seems to be fewer um, non-harassment orders issued by the court than should be the case. Um, this uh, often results in fear, uh, dread, of the victim and sometimes people have to go down the civil route and I understand that the committee has heard some evidence in that regard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Therefore, Amendment 29 is quite straightforward. What it does um, is deletes the words consider whether. Therefore, the court must, without an application by the prosecutor, make a non-harassment order in the person's case. Thus, it would be mandatory and it seems to me that it's a very fundamental principle that the onus should not be on the victim to justify the need for a non-harassment order, but should be on the convicted perpetrator to justify why such an order should not apply. Um, when we then go on to Amendment 30, um, it's more or less consequential on uh, what has happened in Amendment 29. Um, it deletes, the re um, under the section about the reasons for the decisions reached, it deletes, including by explaining why there is a need or no need for the victim to protect, be protected by such an order, and inserts the need to look at the terms of the order and the period for which the order is to run. Uh, the other amendments uh, that are in my name are more or less directly consequential um, to those that I have talked about. And... Um, make the section of the bill operable. Um, I have to say, um, I, in asking a parliamentary question orally last week of the Cabinet Secretary, uh, I do recognise that the Cabinet Secretary is very, very keen to consider ways in which this bill could be strengthened. And it seems when you look at the evidence 
given by those who support it, and that would include Scottish Women's Aid, Scottish Violence Reduction Unit and Victim Support, but most of all, the evidence and testimony of those who have been directly affected, um, both physically in some cases, mentally in other cases, by the fact that there was no non-harassment order granted by the court. I think that is the most compelling um, of all. And just uh, to quote one quote um, from someone I know rather well, a criminal conviction for my husband was of absolutely no use to me as a victim, since that conviction on its own contained no provision to protect me, keep him away from my home and family, and protect me from further abuse with legal consequences should he choose to ignore the court order. I think that is a great problem within the system. And I would therefore uh, say that I find the case for mandatory non-harassment orders compelling. Thank you. Do members have any comments? Um, Liam Kerr? Uh, simply that uh, <coughs> it, it seems to me that the decision should always rest with the court rather than being mandatory irrespective of the circumstances or the strength of the allegations. Uh, and I'm also concerned that uh, such a mandatory nature might have consequences in regard to the ECHR, as we discussed earlier. Liam MacArthur. I, I'm conscious that having just um, spoken to an amendment that removed judicial uh, discretion, I, I'm, I'm now about to uh, raise concerns about ones which I, which I think um, largely has a has a similar um, effect. I think Glenda Fabiani set out very well the frustration um, that is felt and the impact um, that is had by the um, the, uh, the the failure to uh, put in place non-harassment orders. Whether that can be addressed through um, uh, Lord Advocate guidance or, or, or some other mechanism. Um, I think that's certainly something we may even want to look at further within the context of this bill, but I, I would have uh, concerns about um, the, uh, the, the, the mandatory nature of the provision under um, Amendment 29 and, and yeah. consequent amendments. Um, John Finney. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Yeah, well, I, I think Linda Fabiani laid out very clearly some of the consequences of the present system. and. Uh, and I know that this uh, enjoys support of Scottish Women's Aid, and uh, I certainly support it. Um, I certainly think there, there is an issue here, and I understand why Linda Fambiani um, seeks to introduce a mandatory non-harassment order. Um, there has been a problem about non-harassment orders not being granted when they should be. However, I do feel the, the bill has addressed this in terms of ensuring that um, a non-harassment order must be considered, that's mandatory, and if it's refused, there must be a reason for doing that. So I would hope that would uh, go some considerable way to, um, to addressing what, what is a very realistic and um, actual problem without necessarily preaching the, the concerns or raising the concerns under ECHR. If there's no other comments, Cabinet Secretary, to wind up. Thank you, Convener. I'm aware of Linda Fabiani uh, that she has shown a, a long interest in uh, the issue of protection for victims of domestic abuse and has raised these issues with me over an extended period of time. Uh, no one doubts her determination to try and improve the system of non-harassment orders and how they are operating. However, I consider the amendments uh, that she's lodged go too far in terms of removing discretion from our courts to consider what might be in best interests of an appropriate disposal when dealing with domestic abuse offenders. Members will be aware that the bill as introduced uh, includes provisionally uh, warmly welcomed, uh, uh, provisions warmly welcomed by stakeholders and others in respects of non-harassment orders. These provisions have the effect of requiring the court in every domestic abuse case to consider whether to impose a non-harassment order and for the reasons to be given as to why a non-harassment order has or has not been imposed, including explaining why there is or is not a need for the victim to be protected by such an order. So the provisions in the bill, as they stand, will very much ensure the court in every domestic abuse case has to consider the need for protection for the victim as they need to consider whether to impose a non-harassment order. 
In addition, the new sentencing provisions in the bill also mean that when sentencing in domestic abuse cases, the court must have particular regard to the safety of the victim. Taken, taken together, these changes will enhance operation of the system of non-harassment orders so more victims can be protected. While I'm certain that Linda Fabiani's amendments have the best of intentions, I think it is important to highlight the potential effect that they may have. These amendments would remove all discretion from the court so that whenever someone is convicted of domestic abuse, a non-harassment order, order had to be imposed. This would be, with no exception, a blanket requirement as a matter of law. While it is certainly true that non-harassment orders have a key role to play in protecting victims of domestic abuse, it is also true that they may not be appropriate in all cases. For example, take a case where the parties wish to reconcile following a prosecution. In that situation, a non-harassment order may not be appropriate. While uh, there will uh, also be other cases uh, where there is no reconciliation, but the victim may indicate that they do not feel a non-harassment order is necessary and would prefer to have ongoing contact with the accused, perhaps in relation to issues around children. It is also the case that the Crown Office prosecute a very wide range of domestic abuse cases and non-harassment orders would not necessarily be appropriate or necessary in every case. Well, non-harassment orders may well be appropriate in cases involved in... Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm just wondering, in, in terms of coming to a, a decision in terms of uh, Linda Fabian's proposal, do you think that in practical terms, uh, once the new uh, legislation is implemented, there will be more um, non-harassment orders issued as a result of this legislation than has been currently, and perhaps a change in the culture of how the courts look at these particular orders? I believe that will be the case because of the requirement now at the time of sentencing for the courts having to consider it and also to state in open court uh, if they are issuing a non-harassment order or not issuing a non-harassment order, what the reasons are uh, for doing so or not doing so as well, which will help to change that culture around the focus on making sure that the, the time of sentencing, the safety of the victim is at the centre of the court's mind at that particular point in making that uh, decision. While non-harassment orders may be appropriate in cases involving uh, a sustained course of conduct and repeated abusive behaviour, or cases where re-offending uh, was likely, they may not necessarily be appropriate in cases involving isolated incidents or conflict provoked by situational factors. In any event, it should be for the court to make that decision, not simply have to apply the law in a blanket fashion. Convener, there are potential human rights concerns around these amendments in that they require the court to impose a non-harassment order, remembering that a non-harassment order can restrict someone's freedom with no discretion whatsoever to assess whether it is actually necessary in a given case. While I do absolutely sympathise with the member and others in terms of their determination to enhance protection for victims, our courts are there to use their judgment in making decisions of this sort day in, day out. And I think we should trust them to do so while taking into account the specific facts and circumstances of each case. And this is what the bill does as it stands. The steps we have taken to make it mandatory for a non-harassment order to be considered in every case and for reasons to always have it to be given in open court are a significant step forward and provide a very clear message to the court of the importance of utilising non-harassment orders in appropriate cases. While well, these amendments are well-intentioned, they go too far by removing the ability of judges to assess each case they deal with and make decisions based on the facts and circumstances of the case. I'm also concerned that they could bring the system of non-harassment orders into disrepute. If non-harassment orders are being imposed in cases where there is no justification for them on the basis of considering a specific case, then that runs the risk of credibility of non-harassment orders as a disposal being diminished in the eyes of the court and others too. I do not think that that is desirable given the, importance, the important role that non-harassment orders play in preventing, protecting victims. Convener, I've made clear my objections to the amendments as they stand. However, 
I do absolutely sympathise with Linda Fabiani and others who seek to see if any further steps could be taken to strengthen the system of non-harassment orders. And I'm happy to work with Linda Fabiani and others ahead of stage three to see if there are ways that the provisions in the bill could be improved while leaving appropriate discretion to the court. And on that basis, I would invite the member to withdraw Amendment 29 and not move Amendment 30 to 36. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Linda Fabiani to wind up press or withdraw. Yeah, um, I've listened to what my, my colleagues in the committee have said, and I understand the concerns. Um, I also listened very carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary said, and again, understand the concerns. Um, <clears throat> what I would say is um, that the present system quite clearly doesn't work for the victim. And whilst um, this bill is excellent in moving forward, I'm not convinced it goes far enough. However, in light of everything that's been said today, I will withdraw that amendment with a view to looking at stage three of how we could strengthen that bill. I welcome the opportunity to talk that through and um, I wonder if in considering this further, uh, the Cabinet Secretary could, uh, with his team, look quite clearly at the idea of a presumption of a non-harassment order being the case rather than just a consideration. And on that basis, I'll withdraw that amendment. Okay. Is the committee content for this to be withdrawn? Thank yes. you. Right, uh, call amendment 17 in the name of, oh, is it 29? We've done that. Yeah, 17 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with amendment 14. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Question is then call amendment um, 30 in the name of Linda Fabian, they already debated with amendment 29. Uh, Linda Fabiani to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Uh, call Amendment 31 in the name of Linda Fabiani. Already agreed with Amendment 29. Uh, Linda Fabiani to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Um, call Amendment 18 in the name of Liam MacArthur. Already debated with Amendment 14. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Uh, call Amendment 19 in the name of Marie Goujon. Already debated with Amendment 14. Marie Goujon to move or not move? Move. Move. The amendment, uh, the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call them, uh, uh, amendment 20 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 14. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Um, we call Amendment 21 in the name of Marie Goujon, already debated with Amendment 14. Marie Goujon to move or not move? Move. Move. The uh, question is that Amendment 21 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. Called Amendment 20, uh, 32 in the name of Linda Fabiani, already debated with Amendment 29. Linda Fabiani to move or not move? Not move. Not moved. Um, call Amendment 22 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 14. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Not moved. Call Amendment 33 in the name of Linda Fabiani, already debated with Amendment 29. Linda Fabiani to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Call Amendment 34 in the name of Linda Fabiani, already debated with Amendment 29. Linda Fabiani to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Call Amendment 35 in the name of Linda Fabiani, already debated with Amendment 29. Linda Fabiani to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Call Amendment 36 in the name of Linda Fabiani, already debated with Amendment 29. Linda Fabiani to move or not move? Not move. Not move. Call Amendment 24 in the name of Marie Goujon, already debated with Amendment 14. Marie uh, Goujon to move or not move? Move. Move. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, we go straight to Amendment 25 in that case as the preemptions move in. And the question is that Amendment 25 be. All uh, right. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Moved. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. Uh, the question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? It's not moved. Oh, sorry, we're sorry. Not moved. I'm way ahead of myself. I'm either going to ignore you completely or make sure you move it. No, could be no, really. <laughs> right. The, in that case, the question is that the schedule be agreed to. Are we all, are we all agreed? agreed? We are agreed. Right. Call amendment 37 in the name of Claire Baker, grouped with amendments 27 and 28. Claire Baker to move amendment 37 and speak to all amendments in the group. 
Um, thank you, Convener. I'll move Amendment 37 and speak to other amendments. Uh, there are three reasons I would like to set out why I brought forward these amendments. Um, firstly, I think there's frustration at the slow progress we have on uh, development of specialist domestic abuse courts. The one in Glasgow was established in 2004, uh, which resulted in a positive, it was a pilot, it resulted in a positive evaluation, followed by Edinburgh in 2012. We have four courts which cluster Dunfermline, Ayr, Livingston and Falkirk. Um, while I do recognise other courts operate a fast-track system, it means there are large areas of the country that aren't served by any kind of specialist court in these type of cases. So Ed Aberdeen, Dundee, I know members from across the Highlands have raised this issue in the Chamber with the Cabinet Secretary previously at the borders. These can be seen as areas where we see a postcode lottery operating in terms of victims' access to, um, to justice. And I think in these type of courses, cases, we do need the appropriate expertise and sensitivity in dealing with these cases and there's evidence to show that the specialist courts can deliver this. Um, secondly, I think there are concerns over consistency in decision making and confidence in the decisions that are being made and members may be aware there have been a couple of recent cases where um, there have been multiple convictions uh, for the individual, uh, often against crimes committed against different partners, and those cases have resulted in uh, community sentences being given out. Now, I've been contacted by the victims in those cases who have been very distressed by the sentence that has been given out. Those sentences weren't given out in domestic abuse court cases. And I did feel that if the victims had been through a specialist domestic abuse court. I'm not saying the decision of the sheriff would have been any different. However, I think the victim would have felt more confidence in the way in which the decision was made. There was also the case um, last year where a sheriff decided to send the alleged victim, who was a mother, to jail for two weeks on contempt of court because she didn't, according to the sheriff, fully participate in the court proceedings. I did feel at the time that if that case had been heard in a specialist domestic abuse court, I don't imagine that would have happened. So I think there is um, an issue here about consistency and decision making and the confidence of victims. And thirdly, um, I think also that the bill introduces the new offence, which I'm very supportive of, and includes coercive and controlling and psychological abuse within that. I am aware that in the stage one report, there was evidence to the committee a minority set of evidence, but it was from legal experts who expressed um, some concerns about the um, challenges there might be to this legislation within the courts and the discussion there will be around introducing coercive behaviour. Um, I would rather this bill was tested in a specialist court rather than an ordinary court. I think it would have, um, that would have better understanding and expertise of what the Parliament is seeking to achieve here. So the amendments brought forward this morning um, are looking to give full effect uh, to the bill. Um, amendment 27, at the moment, it is the Sheriff Principal who can decide whether to create a specialist court. This would give the power to Scottish ministers to take that forward and be able to designate um, domestic abuse courts. Now, I do recognise uh, and respect the independence of the judiciary in these areas, but I think there is a frustration at the lack of progress there is in establishing specialist courts. Um, amendment 37 looks at the regulations the government can introduce and encourages this to be used to advance specialist courts. And Amendment 28 is about a review of the operation of the Act uh, once the Act has passed to see how the comparison between how uh, decisions are made in regular courts and how they're made in specialist courts. So the amendments this morning are an attempt to push progress within this area to recognise the advantages of specialist courts and look at how this new legislation um, can be best implemented and look to provide equal access to specialist courts to women and all victims across Scotland. Okay, uh, do members have any comments? John Finney, followed by... Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Um, George Adam, Finney and Rona, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you, Convener. I, I fully support uh, Claire Baker and, and she's right to identify, I think, both myself and Rhoda Grant have consistently raised issues about this. And I, the one word that probably would throw people off is specialist, because, of course, if our, um, there was judicial training that covered, or there was the frequency of case use, then some of these very insensitive disposals that have been referred to would not have taken place. And this isn't about new buildings. This is about case management. This is about clustering cases. This is entirely about collaborative working between the, the, the public sector and the third sector uh, on, on issues. So um, I think it's very important that we spread out and there isn't any uh, lesser 
quality of service for victims of domestic abuse just on the basis of geography? Yes, um, I believe, Fulton, you were actually next, then George, then Rona. Yeah, thanks, convener. I've got a lot of sympathy for Claire Baker's um, you know, input, but I, I, I think that I can't envisage any situation where um, Scottish ministers would be best placed, better placed than the, the Lord President um, with this decision. But also, I would just kind of simply say that I actually believe that all courts should be specialist domestic abuse courts, and I think it backs up from what uh, John Finney was talking about there, and I think that... The, the current legislation is put through, going back to my previous uh, intervention on the, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, there, I, I hope to see a culture change around that, and every court should be a specialist court in this regard. Okay, Rona. Oh, sorry, George. <laughs> then Rona. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just to follow on from what Fulton said there as well, I'm, I'm just, I take on board everything that Claire Baker and uh, John Finney brought up with regard to the issue itself. I, I do, I'm just going to ask a question more than anything else, and hopefully the Cabinet Secretary could possibly answer, and Claire Baker herself and her summing up, is because under the Ju uh, Judiciary and Courts uh, Act of uh, 2008, it's the Lord Pre President is the head of the Scottish Judiciary, so are we changing that? Are we kind of jumping ahead here and actually putting that in the Act and the Act's making the decision as opposed to what the current uh, courts are decided on by the Lord President itself. And I'd also ask, uh, has Claire Baker spoken to uh, the Lord President with regards to our amendments here at this stage as well? That's me. Rona, then Mary and Liam Kerr, followed by Ben. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I totally agree with Claire Baker about the slow movement of the creation of domestic abuse courts across the country. Um, I think that's a concern, and I, and I do agree with John about the, the need for uh, more specialist training in, in this area. Uh, but, I, but I do think it compromises the independence of the judiciary, and, and it's not for ministers to, to have the power over uh, the courts and, and uh, the Lord President in that way. Okay, Mary, then Liam Kerr and Bear. Thank you, um, um, Convener. I um, fully support the amendments that have been brought by, by Claire Baker um, th this morning. And if I cast my mind back to some of the, the quite disturbing and distressing evidence that we heard while we were um, taking the, the, the evidence on, on this bill, we heard from victims who had requested special measures, who arrived in court, the special measures were not in place, the support that they had been assured they would be given was not there. Um, and, and quite often the victims were left feeling further traumatised by appearing in a court and the support was not there for them. The things they were promised that would be there were not. Um, and a name of this bill is, is to um, support people, prosecute domestic abuse correctly. And, and I think by um, going down the road of, of specialist courts, it, it would send out a signal to victims of domestic abuse and witnesses that are coming forward that everything that, that they want will be automatically provided for them when they arrive in court. And, and it will remove also, almost a, a, a barrier or an obstacle that they may have in, in their mind to appearing in court. Thank you. Liam Kerr, followed by Ben, then Liam McCarter. Thank you, convener. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, the move... The, the approach of a specialist court is definitely interesting and worth exploring. I think it certainly moves towards a system that perhaps we'd all like to get to. I, I'm not convinced, however, that the amendments as drafted work on a practical level. Uh, I'm not necessarily convinced that practically this is going to work in more rural areas. Uh, and I'm also not convinced that this reflects the realities of the resources available at <coughs> sheriff court level. Uh, my significant concern is that you end up potentially inhibiting justice by creating uh, a, a too rigid, a too inflexible structure. Okay, Ben. Thank you, Convener. I also commend Claire Baker for bringing forward the important point of specialist domestic abuse courts. I share the, the concerns of uh, colleagues George Adam, Fulton McGregor and Rona Mackay about uh, the independence of the judiciary. And we'd also like to, to add as a supplement that perhaps if uh, Claire Baker's amendments fall today, that we as a committee undertake a, a commitment to write to the Lord President on this point, um, expressing the, the views that were, were made today and asking for an update and uh, asking for um, uh, uh, persuading try, uh, with this, uh, uh, an intention to, to seek to, pers uh, to propose the implementation of... Uh, 
more domestic abuse courts as uh, reasonable and uh, prudent within financial constraints. Okay. Liam McArthur. Uh, thank you. Can I also thank Claire Baker for lodging the amendments, allowing the, the discussion this morning to take place. Um, I, I think in, in relation to uh, the frustration she expresses about the progress that's been made in this, I think that's one that um, that we all would share. Um, from a personal perspective, um, I, I, I look at this not just in relation to the islands, but the islands as well, um, and, and how um, such a provision might be um, given effect to. I think we're in the fortunate position in, in Orkney that we have a procurator fiscal and, and a sheriff um, who understand domestic abuse, and, and uh, uh, I, I think in some respects it, it, it points to the, the absolute need, as, as others have referred to, um, for, for training in this area, not to be a specialism, but to be um, absolutely central um, to the uh, to the training that's uh, provided across the across the board. But ultimately, it's about um, timely local access to to, to justice. Um, and the concern I would have is that we put in, in place something um, that isn't necessarily going to be um, straightforward to make work in, in the parts of the country that I, I represent. That would be a concern uh, to me because it is about providing. Um, the, uh, the, the, the timely and appropriate um, support and access to justice that I think Mary Fee in particular was, uh, was stressing in her remarks. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener. Amendment 27 and 37 seek to provide the Scottish Ministers with a power to require the Sheriff Principal of a Sheriffdom to designate one or more court in their Sheriffdom as a specialist domestic court, a de domestic abuse court. Amendment 27 is framed uh, so that this order-making power can only be used where the Lord President has consented to the order being made. However, despite that, I do have some concerns uh, with the amendments, and let me explain why. The Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008, which was passed unanimously by this Parliament, provided that it is the responsibility of the Lord President as head of the independent judiciary and of sheriff principal to ensure the efficient disposal of business through Scotland's courts, including sheriff courts. In addition, uh, that act it provides the, Scottish, the First Minister, the Lord Advocate and the Scottish Ministers and members of the Scottish Parliament must uphold the continued independence of the judiciary. I'm clear that these statutory responsibilities uh, independence of the judiciary and the Lord President being responsible for the management of the courts, and these amendments have implications for this. Alongside the very important constitutional pr principle, there is a very good practical reason why the 2008 Act operates in this way. The independent judiciary know better than anyone else, than anyone, uh, who be how best uh, cases can and should be managed through the courts. When the Lord President, in consultation with the relevant Sheriff Principal, considers that it is appropriate to establish a specialism in domestic abuse cases in a particular sheriffdom, they are able to do so. For example, as we have heard in Glasgow, where a specialism in domestic abuse cases operates, uh, so such cases are held together, as also happens in Edinburgh too. The Lord President can therefore do so without the requirement for the involvement or approval of Scottish Ministers or the Scottish Parliament. In other words, in line with the principles I've outlined from the 2008 Act. Convener, it's difficult to envisage a situation where Scottish Ministers or the Scottish Parliament would be better placed to assess whether such a specialist sheriff is required in a particular area than the Lord President and the Sheriff Principal. As such, it's not clear that this power would ever be used by the Scottish Ministers. Convener, notwithstanding these issues, I'm clear that specialist domestic abuse courts are one way in which the justice system's response to domestic abuse has improved and can continue to improve in the future. And will the level of case volumes mean that it is not practical uh, to have a dedicated court? The Scottish Court and Tribunal Service do provide specific ring fence slots in the court programme to deal with domestic abuse cases. This approach happens in places like Falkirk, Dunfermline, Livingston and Ayr. Convener, delays in dealing with domestic abuse cases was an issue around four years ago. That is no longer the case. In each of the last three years, the Scottish Government has provided additional funding of £2.4 million per year to the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to support their work 
to reduce waiting times for domestic abuse cases in all courts across Scotland. As a consequence, cases involving domestic abuse across Scotland are now having trial dates set within the optimum timescale of eight to 10 weeks. There is a clear expectation that court staff and the judiciary in all courts are able to deal appropriately and sensitively with cases involving domestic abuse. The Scottish Court Tribunal Service recently engaged with Victim Support Scotland to design and run victim awareness training events for staff. The training was provided to all frontline staff in the Sheriff Courts and High Court who come into contact with victims and witnesses during their attendance at court, with 264 members of court and tribunal service receiving uh, training over 30 sessions during 2015 and 2016. Judicial training is the responsibility of the Lord President and training on domestic abuse for members of the judiciary is provided by the Judicial Institute for Scotland. In addition to training, provisions within the Victim and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 ensure that automatic access to specialist measures such as screens and video links are available in all courts for vulnerable witnesses, including victims of domestic abuse. I also have some concerns that the President set involving the, the Scottish Ministers and arrangements for the operation of the courts could set a precedent for all specialist courts. And I don't think that it's within the intent of the Judiciary and Court Act 20, uh, 2008. Give way to the member. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful for taking the intervention, the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, you'll recall that with the closure of certain sheriff courts, remote facilities were put in place, and one of the major beneficiaries of that was intended to be victims of domestic uh, violence. That's not the experience in the Highlands that, that, that there has been the benefit. What assessment's been made of that? Because you, you also comment on judicial training, but you know of examples, a recent appeal court last year, judgment, where it was quite apparent that there was a dearth of training or understanding of, of the issue from uh, the, the, and the appeal was upheld. I, I can't comment specifically in relation to a particular um, a, a particular disposal that was made by a court, uh, including the uh, appeal court, for obvious reasons. Um, but there is a training package which is provided by the Judicial Institute, uh, which is available to all sentences on domestic abuse, as it is with a whole range of other offences, sexual offences, violent offences. Uh, uh, family law matters as well. There are a whole suite of training uh, packages which are available for uh, sentences. Uh, the issue in relation to, for example, I know there has been issues in the Highlands and it's an issue which has been discussed directly with the Sheriff Principal there, um, uh, Sheriff Pyle, um, who's uh, made it clear that the way in which they try to operate there is by clustering cases together, where there is a, a number of cases that they can bring together to be considered at the court in Inverness uh, relating to domestic abuse, they try to do so. Um, the challenge they would have is that uh, given the number of cases which they're dealing with, uh, they would have difficulty in being able to sustain a specialist court in its own right. So that's part of the challenge of being able to meet some of the needs within uh, remote and rural areas, as was highlighted as well, I think, from the comments made by Liam MacArthur in island communities and how they would be sustained and be uh, maintained. Can I now turn to Amendment 28? I understand it is intended to require uh, the Scottish Ministers to publish a report on the operation of new domestic abuse offence and of offences aggravated under Section 11 of the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act. This report is required to publish at the end of the two-year period after this legislation has received royal assent. I agree that it is important that we monitor and evaluate uh, what effect changes uh, that we make in legislation have to ensure that those changes have the effect that we intend. This is true whether the legislation in question is creating a new criminal offence or criminal offence aggravation or making changes to criminal procedures or the powers of police or, or prosecutors. However, much of the information that Amendment 28 requires to be included in the report will be routinely published by the Scottish Government. When a new offence or aggravation is created, existing publications, such as those concerning recorded crime and criminal proceedings, will collect information on the new offence or aggravation, as is already happening with the new intimate images offence and domestic abuse aggravation contained in the, in the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act, which came into force earlier this year 
and will happen with this legislation as well. This means that figures on the number of cases brought under uh, and uh, people convicted of offences at section one of this bill or where the aggravation concerning partner abuse at section one of the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act will be included in annual statistics on criminal proceedings. Information about the length of time it takes the court to dispose of particular categories of cases is not routinely published. However, work is ongoing to consider what additional data it may be useful to collect when the domestic abuse offence comes into force. I think it's important not to rush to lay in statute the specific details of what data must be recorded and published. It's better to consider this in the round in consultation with key interests. Convener, I'd be happy to meet with Claire Baker and others to discuss what may be possible ahead of stage three, if that would be helpful. Convener, I do not think Amendment 28 in its current form is necessary. Such a reporting requirement would set us down a path of creating separate reports for different offences whenever a new offence is created. This risks increasing the burden on colleagues who collect criminal justice data while only providing information that is already available in existing publications. I know that commit the committee are keen to undertake post-legislative scrutiny of legislation they've passed, and I would expect and hope that this committee within, uh, within the years to come will revisit this important piece of legislation should it be passed by Parliament. Adding uh, more bureaucracy in a way that this amendment would do is unnecessary to allow Parliament and committees to undertake what is an essential part of your role, holding government and those who operate legislation to account. Amendment 28 also raises similar issues as Amendment 27. It requires the Scottish Ministers to directly involve themselves in matters which are appropriately the responsibility of the Lord President and Sheriff Principal, namely the programming of our courts. While I understand why the Member may be interested in the issues surrounding the use of domestic abuse courts and clustering of cases in non-domestic courts, given the impact that this has on the independent role of the Lord President, his office should be fully consulted on this matter before agreeing any changes. For these reasons, I would be happy to discuss the matter further before stage three in order to consider this issue in more detail and to ensure that Lord President's office has been given an opportunity to engage in this matter and to consider the issues that come from that. I'd therefore like to invite members to withdraw. They invite member to withdraw Amendment 37 and not move Amendment 27 and 28. Okay, Claire Breaker to wind up a press or withdraw. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I would like to thank all members for their contributions this morning and for the cabinet secretary as well. I think it's been an interesting discussion about how we can make progress here. I will try to cover um, some of the points that have been raised. Um, I do agree that the cultural change has been slow and members have made good points around judicial training and the gaps that are identified within that. Within this legislation, it's not possible to address that issue and that's why I've looked more specifically at the um, domestic abuse courts. Now, Amendment 27, um, while I recognise the Cabinet Secretary's reservations around that, as he pointed out himself, the order could only be made with the consent of the Lord President. Um, so there is, uh, that is specified within it. Um, also, the Cabinet Secretary, while I do recognise and welcome the fast tracking that happens in certain cases, um, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect a specialist sheriff to be operating in all areas across Scotland. I think actually that's necessary and I'm disappointed that we haven't reached that point given we had a pilot in 2004 that was positively received. Um, so understanding the points the Cabinet Secretary has made, I still intend to press um, Amendment 27. Um, and I'd also hope that ministers could um, reflect on the need for post-legislative scrutiny for a review. And while the Cabinet Secretary has outlined reservations around the amendment perhaps being too specific uh, and that the information is already published, that it's sometimes it can be difficult to find this information when it's published. I think a report that gathers together the case would be um, more... Member, Sorry. we haven't reached 27 yet and we'll ask you if you're going to... It's 37 that I'll be asking you about. Um, directly. Okay. Yeah, I've indicated no. the intention that once I'm called I will um, make it clear yeah. what I intend okay. to do but just to let members know at this stage that I would still be quite keen to press forward to that amendment. Okay. Uh, my intention is not to move um, 
Amendment 37, which I've been requested. Thank that. you for that. And members content that Member 7 is withdrawn? 37 yes. is withdrawn. Thank yes. you. Um, the question is that Section 12 be agreed. Are we all agreed? That concludes our consideration of amendments uh, at stage two thus far. The committee will conclude consideration of the remaining stage two amendments on December the 5th. And can I thank the minister and officials for attending. We now have a, a brief suspension for 10 minutes and comfort break to allow the next uh, panel to come in.
Item 5 is our sixth and final evidence session on the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill. I refer members to Paper 5, which is a note by the clerk. And, yeah. and Paper 4, which is a private paper, and I welcome Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, and her officials, Hamish Goodall, Civil Law and Legal System Division, and Greg Walker, Solicitor, Directorate of Legal Services, Scottish Government. And I believe you wish to, to make an opening statement, Minister. Yes, I, I, I wouldn't mind, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Convener and, and Committee. I'm grateful for this opportunity to make some opening remarks. And before doing so, I, I felt it would be appropriate on this occasion to remind uh, members of my uh, entry in the Register of Interest. Uh, and uh, if they were to look there, they would find that I... I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland in that I hold a current practising certificate, albeit that I'm not currently practising. Convener, we know from Sheriff Principal Taylor's review of the expenses and funding of civil uh, litigation in Scotland that the potential costs involved in civil court action can deter many people from pursuing legal action even where they have a meritorious claim. There is therefore a need for more certainty as to the cost of exercising their rights. Three major reforms proposed in this bill will make the cost of civil litigation in Scotland more predictable and so increase access to justice. Sliding caps on success fees, allowing solicitors to offer damages-based agreements and qualified one-way costs shifting. The first of these reforms, the introduction of sliding caps on success fees, has been generally welcomed and I am uh, minded initially to set the levels at those suggested by Sheriff Principal Taylor in his uh, report. The second of these reforms will allow solicitors to offer damages-based agreements directly rather than through claims management companies. Damages-based agreements are very popular as they are simple to understand. Basically, the client will pay nothing up front and will pay a percentage of the damages awarded or agreed to the provider of the legal services. The solicitor will be responsible for, for all outlays in personal injury actions. As Sheriff Principal Taylor stated in his evidence, one solicitor-owned claims management company has entered into some 17,600 new damages-based agreements in the last three years and 23,800 in the last five years. This perhaps would go some way to explaining the rise in the number of claims in Scotland over the last five years about which others giving evidence have uh, uh, flagged up. Uh, and whilst on the subjects of claims management companies, I appreciate that there has been concern that the bill does not make provision for their regulation. I am pleased, therefore, to be able to tell the committee that appropriate amendments to the financial guidance and claims bill currently being considered at Westminster have been tabled and they are expected to be voted on later today at the Lord's third reading. Claims management companies will therefore be regulated in Scotland more quickly than was first uh, anticipated. The third major reform is the introduction of qualified one-way costs shifting for personal injury cases. Qualified one-way cost shifting will level the playing field as the vast majority of defenders are well resourced and the majority of pursuers are of limited means. Although very few claimants are pursued for expenses by successful defenders, there is always a risk that a pursuer may be liable for considerable expenses and possibly bankruptcy if they lose. Sheriff Principal Taylor confirmed that there is real fear which stops too many meritorious claims from getting off the ground. Qualified one-way costs shifting removes the risk as long as the pursuer and his or her legal team have conducted the case appropriately. The test of when the benefit of qualified one-way cost shifting can be lost has been the subject of varying views, uh, as witnessed by the evidence uh, already given. Defender groups have suggested that the bar is too high, and pursuer groups have contended that the bar is too low. Both groups have con expressed concerns that the provisions as drafted in Section 8, Subsection 4 will lead to satellite litigation. We will consider amendments at Stage 2 to make it clearer that it is the tests envisaged by Sheriff Principal Taylor that are to be applied. The bill also makes provision for third-party funding. Sheriff Principal Taylor recommended that all third-party funding should be disclosed. However, only venture capitalists whose only interest in the case is commercial will be liable for awards of expenses. There have been concerns that awards will be made against trade unions and legal service providers. Trade unions do not have a financial interest in the proceedings, so they will not be subject to the award uh, of expenses under the bill as uh, drafted. We are considering whether an amendment is necessary to make it clear that providers of success fee uh, agreements will not be subject to the provision. 
Finally, convener, I would wish to mention briefly uh, the issue of group proceedings. As the committee will have seen, the proposal to introduce class actions to the Scottish courts has broad support. I am convinced that the way forward is to introduce an opt-in system, as it is prudent when introducing a new procedure in the Scottish courts to select the option which will be easier and quicker to implement. However, this does not rule out introducing the opt-out procedure uh, at a later date, and we will keep this issue under review. So uh, those would, that would conclude, uh, convener, my opening remarks, and I look forward to uh, questions from the committee. Thank you, Minister. We now move straight to questions, starting with John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, thank you for your opening statement there. Uh, Minister, we're told the objective of the Bill is to increase access to justice. Now, we've also heard from a, a number of witnesses the suggestion that access to justice isn't a problem. Can you outline why you think the Bill is necessary, please, and how you believe it will improve access to justice? OK, um, I, I think it's um, important to, to go back to, to first principles, if you like, and uh, I, 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 I reiterate what, what happens when you would be trying to bring, uh, a, a, in particular, personal injury action. And you would, first of all, want to know what your own solicitor was going to charge you, what was that cost going to be? And you would also, very importantly, want to know what your potential liability could be uh, for the defender's uh, expenses uh, if you were uh, to lose. So uh, that introduces uh, uh, considerable unpredictability in terms of what the bill will be for you trying to, uh, in your view, assert your, uh, your legal rights. Uh, and what the bill is designed to do is to deal with, with each of these areas of unpredictability in turn uh, and also to uh, increase the funding options available uh, to a pursuer seeking to, uh, to take a, a, a claim through the courts. So uh, in terms of the, uh, the greater predictability and certainty as to what your own solicitor could charge you, uh, in terms of the approach we have taken up from Sheriff Principal Taylor, we would uh, propose to have a sliding cap uh, on the percentage that can be uh, taken by way of success free from any uh, award received. Uh, and uh, that is on the, the basis as described by Sheriff Principal Taylor in his report, which we have taken up in the bill, that for the first 100,000, the cap, the maximum cap, now this would not be a requirement on the solicitor to charge a maximum cap, but this would be what the maximum would be, 20% of 100,000. Between 100,000 and 400,000, the cap proposed is 10%, and above 500,000, the cap proposed is 2.5%. So that gives some clarity there. As regards outlays and personal injury actions, we have proposed in the bill that these be met by the pursuer's solicitor. So again, that is clarity. As regards the issue of liability, uh, uh, for defenders' expenses and the, uh, the, what has been called the David versus Goliath uh, asymmetric relationship as between the pursuer and the defender in personal injury actions, what we have proposed, again taking up Chair Principal Taylor's uh, uh, recommendation, is that in the case of personal injury actions there could be what's called qualified one-way cost shifting, and I know the committee is now an expert on this term of art, so I don't need to uh, belabor that point, but we would propose that that happens for personal injury actions, and of course, uh, it is the, 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 the important word here is qualified, so it is not an absolute, but if, uh, assuming that the pursuer and their legal team have acted appropriately, then the benefit of the qualified one we call shifting should not be lost, and therefore there is predictability and certainty uh, and removal of the fear that by seeking to raise a court action, you could be sequestrated uh, if you were found liable for the defender's expenses. Uh, and as to why there should be uh, this uh, desire to create some equity in funding as between the pursuer and the defender, it is, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, seen uh, as in the vast majority of cases, it is very much a David and Goliath battle involving a defender uh, who is an insurance company or is backed by an insurance company. And, and therefore, these are the kind of key principles underpinning this legislation uh, that uh, we uh, expect. Therefore, uh, sorry, and one other issue I would mention here, of course, is that the uh, solicitor profession will be allowed to enter into damages-based agreements for the first time. So, all in all, we feel that this will uh, allow um, potential pursuers to consider carefully whether they wish to, to pursue uh, their rights in the courts by way of a civil claim uh, and not to not pursue that simply on the basis of worry about uh, the cost to them and potential uh, sequestration. 
Okay, thank you for that detailed uh, answer. You'll, I think there'll be very specific questions from my f now fellow experts on this subject. Can I, can I, <laughs> can I stick with the generality, uh, please, Minister? And, and that is that we've had a lot of anecdotal evidence about the issue and this much used phrase, access to justice. There seems to be a, a, a dearth of up-to-date research on that. I wonder, would you commit to doing some up-to-date research on the issue? Um, what I would say is, uh, I, I have read the, the, carefully the, the committee evidence thus far, and I, I think, first of all, in terms of the, um, the issue of, of, of statistics, I think it has been sort of brought out in the evidence thus far that actually, um, the, certainly the number of claims recorded uh, has, has risen, but the number of cases actually being litigated has remained you know, more or less the same since 2009-10. I think actually there's been from the civil justice statistics, a slight drop uh, in the number of cases raised, uh, personal injury cases raised, for example, in 2015-16 as compared with 2009-10. Uh, and uh, I, I think that that is important to bear in mind so that actually the, the, the number of, of cases before the courts in terms of personal injury claims has, has more or less remained constant, albeit that there have been an increase in claims. Many claims don't go anywhere or they're settled uh, long before you get to uh, the courts. So on that basis, the, the suggestion that um, you know, the world is very different to when Sheriff Principal Taylor was conducting his two and a half year long uh, review, I, I'm not necessarily convinced of. But of course, he did conduct a very long and thorough review and had a very impressive reference group who assisted him with his work. Also, of course, we did proceed with a consultation on this bill, as, as we are required to do, and the consultation was in the first half of 2015, which is uh, more recent, uh, and the majority of the responses, uh, more responses favoured proceeding with the, the bill in terms of the key provisions that we are proposing today than, than uh, opposed those. Uh, and so, therefore, we do feel that... Um, we have a, a, as reasonable a picture as, as we can get because, of course, in the end of the day, raising a civil action is a permissive uh, choice on the part of the pursuer. It's not something that we can anticipate in any great numbers. But uh, also, finally, I would say to the member that I think it was um, the representative from the Lost Society of Scotland when giving evidence uh, and discussing whether there should be a delay to wait for regulation of claims management companies through some vehicle, which we probably will get on to, I think she felt rather, let's just get on with the bill. So I think there is a feeling that, you know, we just want to, to make some progress with this amongst uh, key stakeholders. Uh, the Minister, if you, you could be quite brief in, in just asking the specific points, because we will get on to more of the detail yes, okay. um, in our questioning. John, many? One final question, and I'll make this brief. And, and this, this was an area highlighted um, by trade union respondents who felt that um, this would remain a barrier for members pursuing personal injury claims, and that was the issue of court fees, um, Minister. Now, they propose a, a Cox-like solution where court fees would only be paid at the end of a case where the defender loses. Is this something the Scottish Government will commit to investigating, please? Um, what I would say is, you may be aware that actually there is an ongoing consultation on court fees. I think it was started in October and it's due to close on the 12th of January. So that might be an opportunity for those who, who wish to have a look at that. Um, on the issue of, of court fees, um, I, you know, if, if they're not pay as you go, then somebody else is paying them and that would be the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and the Scottish taxpayer. So that is something to bear in mind. I think also, you know, when I read Sheriff Taylor's uh, report, um, the, the point was made that, um, you know, the, the issue of 100% of cost recovery was not really something that, and quoting Lord Justice Jackson in England, was not really something that was ever uh, an accepted principle of the law in terms of law of cost because it was felt rather that there should be some discipline uh, uh, instituted in the system such that uh, it could act as a deterrent against frivolous claims and, and ha in, in, invoke discipline in keeping costs to a minimum. So, uh, as I say, there is an ongoing uh, consultation on, on court fees, and I would imagine that some of these uh, points will be raised in the context of that. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank you. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Um, in your opening um, statement, uh, Minister, you said that um, you were minded to approve the caps on success fees recommended by Chair Principal Taylor. Um, can you clarify whether that would be done through secondary legislation? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we feel that that would be the, the better course. Uh, it would allow uh, flexibility to keep these under uh, review and, and to be able to amend where appropriate in, in, in due course 
rather than having to amend primary legislation. So it would be our intention to proceed by way of uh, secondary legislation and, as I indicated, at the levels uh, proposed by Sheriff Principal uh, Taylor. And there would be a con that would be an affirmative uh, instrument and there would be a consultation on that instrument. Thank you. Um, can I move on to damage-based agreements and solicitors' conflict of interest? Um, Sheriff Principal Taylor recommended that a solicitor should be required to write a client, write to a client outs outlining all these funding options and giving reasons for, for that recommendation. It's a bit unclear about how these matters will be taken forward, so can you outline what additional steps the Scottish Government is taking to address this issue of conflict of interest in damages-based agreements? And would that be either through secondary legislation or with the Law Society? Okay, um, that uh, would, as far as damages-based agreements are concerned, uh, that would really be a, a matter for the Law Society to look at in terms, as far as solicitor profession is concerned, to look at in terms of, of practice rules applicable. And I understand that actually, and I think it was referred to by Professor Alan Patterson, there is a working group of the Law Society that has been set up to look at that. Uh, issue and I would also just say I know you've asked about members asked about damages based agreements but it, I think it is worth pointing out briefly that as regards speculative fee agreements which have been in place for some 25 years it, it is accepted that there is a, a theoretical conflict possible but nonetheless that has not precluded uh, the operation in practice of, of speculative fee agreements and I think therefore uh, it would be uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, straightforward to come up with practice rules that uh, secured the end that of the objective rather that is being sought here. Okay, just on a general level, um, what influence does the, the Scottish Government have over the Law Society in this area? I mean, can can you direct them or influence them or? <coughs> um, well, they are an independent body, so it wouldn't be appropriate, I don't think, for me as Minister to direct the Law Society on this matter in terms of their, their practice rules. But by the same token, I meet regularly with representatives uh, of the Law Society, the Chief Exec and the, the president of the Law Society, and we have wide-ranging discussions. Uh, so I would always be happy to raise issues, but I don't think it would be for the Scottish Government to direct the Law Society on particular practice rules that they would uh, be considering. Okay, thank you. Fulton McGregor. Thanks, Convener. Um, my question is on the compensation for future loss, and, and obviously we know that can be, be important um, in meeting pursuers' future care needs. Do you think, uh, Minister, that we've struck the right balance in this um, particular bill and, and allowing a part of that board to be taken as a success fee? Um, well, I, I remember reading uh, this part of the Taylor Review and, and then the bill very carefully. And of course, um, I think it's important to, to recall why uh, Chair Principal Taylor felt uh, that this would be a, a sensible way forward. Uh, and um, the, the fact is that the consideration was that there could be a uh, a potential incentivisation of, of delay because you could argue then that you would seek to delay uh, settlement or the case coming to a conclusion because more loss would be attributable to the past than the future. I think also it was felt in terms of trying to, to make civil litigation more predictable, to, to simplify it, to, to uh, uh, ensure greater access to justice. I think it was felt that uh, you know, in many cases, particularly in settlements, if, if you were to, to spend time trying to attribute past loss and future loss in cases where you know, you're not at your two million mark, I think Chair Principal Taylor referred to where it was very clear you're talking about future loss, then again, you're using up a lot of time in, in coming to that, uh, uh, that uh, conclusion. Also, it's important to say there are safeguards. You're talking, the member talked about a balance. Uh, being reached and there, it is recognised that it is necessary to reach a balance and therefore there are safeguards such that um, where the, finan the future loss element of the damages exceeds £1 million, uh, you would require to have the court approval uh, to treat that as a lump sum from which you could take the, the success fee or alternatively in, in settlement situations you would require to have an independent actuary uh, conclude that the payment should be made by way of a lump sum. So in that regard there are safeguards uh, uh, written into the bill. And, and finally, I would say that um, I, I understand from reading Sheriff Principal Taylor's evidence to this committee and his report that although Lord Justice Jackson, who proceeded with an equivalent look at costs and funding of litigation in England and Wales, had concluded that the future loss element should be ring-fenced, um, Sheriff Principal Taylor suggested that, in fact, he had understood that Lord Justice uh, the, Lord Justice uh, Jackson was, uh, perhaps had some cold feet after that decision and felt perhaps he had responded to a particular lobby at the time. So I think we have struck uh, the, the right balance as between 
uh, uh, the, the, the two uh, imperatives here, uh, and uh, that is uh, the, the way that we have uh, drafted the bill. Uh, and following on for that, um, uh, just briefly, Minister, does uh, do you see any merit, for, uh, any merit, sorry, any merit at all in the, the solution that the faculty ad advocates put forward in terms of um, suggesting a taper in the amount that can be taken as a success fee? Um, well, we, we do, uh, in fact, have a taper, and it's quite a straightforward one, uh, the, the, such that, you know, in, in cases over, it claims over uh, 500,000 uh, and up to a million, where, uh, you know, you wouldn't get into this necessity, quite rightly, for, for court approval or independent actuarial approval, that the, the rate is 2.5%. So that actually uh, uh, is uh, uh, quite a, 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 a good um, safeguard in that regard and, and I think is a more straightforward approach, uh, the one that we have set forward than the, the one that I think the faculty of advocates were uh, suggesting. My questions relate to qualified one-way cost shifting. And I know you touched on some of that in your response to John Finney earlier and that was a really interesting element to take, uh, to take evidence on because uh, we had heard in evidence that, and I think one of my fears personally had been that, you know, you're not, we hear about the, the David and Goliath scenario, but it may not always be the case that uh, in personal injury cases where you are up against uh, a, a larger body. And we had uh, evidence from the Faculty of Advocates who had suggested limiting quarks to cases where the defender is insured or a public body. So just wondering how you would respond to that evidence and if that's something that you've d uh, taken cognizance of. Um, yes, so the... I, I have noted that debate with interest and uh, also, again, what Chair Principal Taylor uh, uh, said in his evidence session at the end of October. And I, I think it's an important point that he made that, um, uh, you know, if, if there is a straw man, so if you have a defender who, you know, is not the insurance company or, you know, backed by an insurance company, then, you know, if you have a straw man, what's the point of raising the action? Because you won't be recovering any money. So I think that was one uh, factor to bear in mind. I think also if we go back to the fundamental uh, objective of introducing qualified one-way cost shifting, and that is to introduce predictability into the, the, the cost equation for a person considering taking an action and, and enforcing their, their rights. Uh, and the predictability element is that you know, if it's a no win, no fee in a damages based agreement basis, then you go in and if you lose, you don't pay anything. If you win, then the arrangements are, as, as, as we know, in terms of the, the provisions of the bill uh, 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 and that the pursuer would meet the, the outlays. So uh, I think it, in terms of the predictability objective of the bill, uh, it is uh, important that we maintain uh, the position as suggested. Also, I think it was suggested by Sheriff Principal Taylor that if you were to seek to make any qualification here, uh, it could perhaps not preclude circumvention by the defender. So it may be a defender who actually should be getting insurance but has chosen not to be insured or seeks a much bigger excess when the, that wouldn't be the normal commercial uh, approach. I, I think also um, it's important to remember here that the, the, the evidence that was cited in Sheriff Principal Taylor's report uh, where he referred to work done under Lord Justice Jackson's report, such that in the samples of, I think, tens of thousands of cases cited, uh, only 0.1% of cases involved cases where the defender had recovered any uh, expenses uh, in those circumstances. So I think that's important to bear in mind. And finally, of course, there is qualified one-way cost shifting in England and Wales. That was introduced in legislation in 2012. Um, actually, there has recently been a, a UK government post-legislative uh, scrutiny of that legislation, I think tabled at the end of October of this year, uh, and uh, no significant concerns were raised about qualified one-way cost shifting. So uh, I think bearing in fact, all these factors, uh, uh, taking all these factors into account and bearing them in mind, I think uh, we have struck the right balance in the bill. Thank you very much. And that, uh, the post-legislative scrutiny in England and Wales was something that I hadn't been aware of yet, so thank okay. you for, for highlighting that. Um, I, we'd also heard from witnesses that there was a concern that the test for losing the quotes protection uh, lacked clarity and may lead to further litigation. And I was really just looking to get your, your thoughts on that as well, um, because there was particular concern that they didn't meet the, it didn't implement the Taylor recommendation of Wednesbury unreasonableness. Yes, uh, we have uh, 
listened to the evidence presented and, and also, of course, in the, the recent submissions. And yes, we would be intending to reflect on that further for stage two. Obviously, we want the bill to be as clear on its face as we can possibly uh, ensure that it is. Uh, and we do accept that uh, there could be certain clarity introduced. Um, and uh, as far as the, the general uh, thrust of, of, of the uh, amendments, which would have still to be framed, but obviously our, our, our commitment was to introduce uh, the, the test as envisaged by Shared Principal Taylor, and that would include with regard to the Wednesbury case. Uh, uh, and uh, I think suggestions have been made in the course of your evidence about what the phraseology would be. But obviously, at this stage today, I'm not in a position to say exactly, but we would be definitely seeking to implement what Shared Principal Taylor had in mind in that regard. Very helpful, thank you. And I just have one final question. Uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor had recommended that Quox protection uh, was also lost in an additional scenario when a case was summarily dismissed. And he saw that as being a uh, protection against spurious claims. And is that something else that you've also taken into consider consideration and will be looking at? Uh, yes, we will look at that. I think it was a fair point that you made and we will uh, reflect on that as to how best that can be uh, secured. Okay, thank you very much. Liam Kerr. Good morning. Uh, I'd just like to <coughs> carry on in, in the uh, line that uh, Mary Goujon is taking. The, the bill doesn't deal with tenders. Uh, now, when he appeared before the committee, Sheriff Principal Taylor suggested that the bill should make clear that the failure to beat a tender was, would be an exception to quarks. Uh, does the Minister accept that recommendation and uh, will you be bringing forward amendments to deal with it, if so? Um, Okay, so the issue of tenders, um, in fact, that is uh, normally dealt with as a matter of court rules. Uh, and what I understand has been happening is that the Cost and Funding Committee of the Scottish Civil Justice Council uh, is uh, reflecting on this and is actually to have a meeting on the 4th of December. Uh, and I understand that uh, we'll get a better idea of what their thinking is in terms of potential court rules to deal with the issue of tenders as, uh, as far as qualified one week cost shifting is concerned. Uh, further to their meeting on the 4th of December. So could I take that as a potentially there'll be amendments? <laughs> uh, well, it, it, I think uh, it's clear that uh, there was a desire to have a clearer picture of what would happen in such circumstances uh, of a, a tender where a tender is not beaten and the impact vis-a-vis -vis qualified one-way cost shifting. What I'm saying is that thus far the issue of tenders has been dealt with by way of court rules and it is the relevant court rules bodies that are currently looking at this. So we will... Uh, be uh, very interested to see what uh, they propose further to the work that's currently undergoing. Thank you. Uh, the Defender representatives uh, to this committee have suggested that Quox would encourage a compensation culture. Uh, they highlighted various additional steps that could be taken to protect against this uh, and highlighted such things as fixed costs and pre-action protocols, uh, which I think I might be saying is, is something that's different in England and Wales uh, in relation to that review you, you alluded to. Uh, can you outline whether the Scottish Government is going to take any action in these areas? And, and also, did you consider these uh, in the drafting of the bill? Uh, and if so, if they were considered, why were they not included? Okay, um, on the issue of, of um, the fixed costs, if you look at, uh, if one looks at Sheriff Principal Taylor's report, um, he did uh, refer to the issue of fixed costs and uh, had uh, recommended that that be introduced with regard to the new simple procedure, so the amalgamation of summary costs and the small claims. And I think I also felt that that should be given time to bed down to see how that works as a matter of practice. On the issue of the pre-action protocols, there is actually a mandatory pre-action protocol in place for claims up to £25,000 in the Sheriff Courts. Um, obviously, the pre-action protocols are again a matter for the, uh, the court rules and the Scottish Civil Justice Council is the body designated now by the 2014 Act to, to deal with these matters. Um, and it would be open uh, to the Scottish Civil Justice Council and its subcommittees to look at the issue of, of extending the mandatory uh, pre-action protocol to, to different levels of, of threshold of, of claim, but that would be a matter for, for them. Uh, and uh, the, the issue of the compensation culture, I think it's fair to say that not all witnesses uh, felt that there was a compensation culture in England and Wales. They didn't feel there was one in Scotland and they didn't feel that this bill would lead to one in Scotland either. So I think it's important to reflect that part of the evidence uh, as well. If I might just remain on compensation culture uh, and, and what witnesses were feeling. Uh, we've heard various witnesses from various NHS boards suggest that there could be an increase in claims, which of course in some ways is the point of the legislation. 
Uh, certain boards have suggested that they don't have insurance to cover such claims. Some have suggested that uh, the increase in costs for clinical neg negligence claims would be very difficult to cover. Uh, and ultimately, pressures on the budgets as a result of an increase in claims could have an impact on healthcare delivery. Uh, do you have anything to say to those NHS boards about their, what I would suggest are legitimate concerns? Well, I, I'm not aware of any NHS board that doesn't have insurance in place. I think that would be quite worrying, but obviously we'll go and check that with colleagues. I, I, I would have thought all NHS boards would have insurance in place. But anyway, we will check that point. I mean, obviously the, the, there's many factors here. Um, uh, the, the committee is aware of the uh, damages bill that was referred to in the Scottish Government's programme for government and it is intended to bring that forward uh, early 2018 and one of the elements of that will deal with um, mandatory periodical payment orders which is circumstances where you have a catastrophic case and you need to make an arrangement for future loss uh, and uh, future caring. Uh, arrangements uh, and the periodical payment orders will uh, 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 allow that to happen uh, and the provision in the bill will require that to be mandatory, i.e. to override the, the, the views of the, the parties to the case uh, because at the moment both parties require to consent to a PPO being granted. Uh, so that, if one recalls that the, uh, the bill uh, provides already for the fact that where you have a future loss element uh, if there is a PPO to be recommended, uh, then the, the damages cannot be uh, taken from that aspect, uh, element of the future loss where there's a PPO element uh, in, in uh, consideration. So I think that's an important uh, safeguard in that re regard. Um, in general terms, I mean, going back to, I think, some of the points I was alluding to in my opening remarks, I mean, if, you, if you've got no prospect, if, if a client comes to see a lawyer and there's no prospect of, of recovering any money, including for the lawyer, then, you know, they the ain't going to take on the case. Also, a lawyer is an officer of the court uh, and, you know, are subject to various um, rules and regulations, including not clogging up court time with vexatious cases and having statable cases. And, uh, you know, the mandatory pre-action protocol, I think, as well, uh, will act as a, a, a help in that regard. And finally, the the benefit of the qualified, of the cost shifting, of course, can be lost, but only in certain circumstances. But nonetheless, it is not an absolute. So I think these are important factors to bear in mind. Forgive me, Minister. Well. I, I don't think my question was sufficiently clear. Uh, effectively, what I'm saying is uh, more clinical negligence claims, more cost to the NHS, uh, more pressure on budgets. It, do you have any response uh, to the NHS in relation to that? Uh, well, I, I think, uh, starting from first principles, um, if, if people have got a right to bring a claim, they have got a right to bring a claim, and it will be for the court to determine, uh, 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 or the parties to settle in advance of that, what the rights and wrongs of that case are. Uh, and therefore, if there has been a wrong and a failure to, to act, then uh, I, I don't think you would be suggesting that there shouldn't be a remedy for the citizens of this country. Uh, so I think uh, it is fair to say that uh, if you have, a, 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 if you have a, a right, you should be entitled to seek enforcement of that right through the courts and have access to justice. And as I say, the uh, periodical payment element uh, in terms of the proposed damages bill uh, should uh, play a, a, a role uh, here because, of course, the, the, the success fee cannot be taken from the PPO. So I think that uh, would help matters here as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Maurice Corey. Thank you, Mina. Um, <clears throat> good morning, Minister. Um, in respect to the regulation of claims management companies, would the Minister make a commitment uh, that there will be no gap uh, between the provisions of the current bill coming into force and the regulatory re regime for the claims management companies being in place? Um, well, I, I don't think I would be in a position to do that because I think, as I indicated at the outset, that we have uh, had uh, amendments tabled uh, and they will be considered today uh, in the Lords uh, uh, further to the UK Financial Guidance and Claims Bill. Uh, if they uh, pass and the legislation passes, then the, this arrangement will be set up by way of, of uh, secondary legislation. I'm not uh, in charge of secondary legislation uh, on the part of the UK government. Uh, I don't have any control over the timing of that, but I, I wouldn't anticipate that, the, that if there's any gap, it would be unduly long. And also I'd make the important point that when it becomes clear that regulation is coming down the line, coming imminently down the line, I think that you know uh, will have a, a significant impact on any pretensions of any claims management companies uh, in that regard. Thank you. Can I answer that? 
Minister, you have control of when this this um, act comes Oh, absolutely. I, I do, do have control over that. And what I'm saying is that there's two pieces of the picture here. One is uh, what happens with secondary legislation uh, in, in London and what happens here. But I'm making the point also that uh, even if there were to be a short gap, nonetheless, uh, it, there would be a clear signal that regulation was uh, coming very shortly down the line. And I think that would be a, a big game changer uh, uh, in that regard. Okay. Maurice Corrie. Nelson Alderman, please. Thanks. Um, yes, Minister, I refer to the claims management companies who have been recognised uh, as a significant source of nuisance calls, and bearing in mind that a significantly greater number in Scotland than, than the rest of the UK. Um, as it's been determined. The Taylor Review made recommendations around this, including a ban on cold calling and a requirement that only regulated bodies could receive referral fees. What steps are you taking uh, to implement these recommendations? Okay, on the issue of referral fees, um, uh, again, uh, I would imagine that's something that the Law Society would wish to be looking at in its working group, and obviously uh, for other regular regulated bodies being the claims management companies, that will be a matter for their regulatory system under the FCA, assuming these regulations pass and the, the legislation passes as a whole at Westminster. Uh, and in terms of Scottish government action, obviously the power, juris the jurisdiction over cold calls and texts lies still uh, as a reserve matter to Westminster, but I know that the Scottish government have been active in this area and set up a, a nuisance uh, commission and have been looking at a number of pr pragmatic measures that can perhaps help and also have, uh, I think, uh, set aside some funding to uh, assist with call blocking units for uh, vulnerable groups. So there has been activity on the part of the Scottish Government. But in terms of the referral fee issue, uh, that would be a matter for the Law Society and for the, presumably for the FCA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary Fee. Thank you, um, <coughs> convener. I wanted to explore in a bit more detail the issue of third party funding and, and I'm grateful for the comments that, um, Minister, you made in, in your opening remarks. And you'll know from our um, evidence sessions that unions particularly have raised concerns that they will be caught up in, in third party um, funding. Um, and, and if I'm to understand correctly from your previous remarks, you do intend to, to bring amendments. I wonder if you can give us any further detail about how those amendments will be framed so there is absolute clarity on who will be caught up by this. Okay, um, I'm afraid I can't give you the chapter and verse exactly what the amendments will say because those are still, as far as I'm aware, to be drafted. But yes, we will uh, seek to do that at stage two because we do accept that we need to introduce further clarity here. Uh, I mean, it, it is um, the, the view that actually, as far as the trade unions are concerned, um, the current language wouldn't catch them, but we will still reflect on all the, the points made just to be 100% sure that our reading of this is correct. As regards legal services providers, we do feel that there is a, a, an obvious um, uh, lack of clarity there and we'll be looking at that. But we will, you know, we understand the points being made and it's absolutely not the intention to have caught trade unions here or legal service providers. It is your venture capitalist commercial uh, third party funders that this is about and that is what we want to ensure that the, uh, the legislation uh, achieves. So there'll be a clear definition as to who, who who you are meant to be catching and not. Okay. And, and will, you, will we also, in, in relation to the requirements on third party funders, will you make it clear what their requirements are in comparison to general funders? Um, okay, on the first point, as I say, the, the, the drafting is still to be done, but it, I do fully understand the, the concerns and these will be absolutely reflected in, in the drafting. Uh, second, on the issue of um, transparency, uh, I, that was to be a, a, an obligation um, on all third party funders so that the court and the other side knew what was going on in terms of funding uh, and that will be again I think there was a concern that, that had been conflated a bit with the liability issue so again we will have a look at that and make hope to make that absolutely clear that that is an obligation that is uh, ergo omnes whereas the liability issue is uh, for the commercial funders of the, the venture capitalists. That's helpful thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. thank you. Maurice Corrie. Um, Minister, uh, in respect to the appointment of auditors of the court, um, why does the Scottish Government consider that employment by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service is a better guarantor of independence than the auditors being self-employed? Um, okay, uh, is it a better guarantor? I, it's, it's, um, it's, 
at least the, it provides uh, uh, the same guarantee as far as independence is concerned. But I think the issues here that, um, in terms of my reading, have been issues to do with accountability. So, for example, the FOI process is not available uh, at the moment. Uh, so, issues of transparency, uh, issues of better consistency, because I know that uh, a number of practitioners uh, have concerns that this can from time to time be a bit of a lottery and, and clear guidance would be helpful. Um, also in terms of the, um, the, the status, we advocate there should be salaried positions within the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service. Um, we feel that the, uh, the, 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 the auditor should not be making a private profit out of a public service, which is the position at the moment. Uh, and we feel that the provisions that we have put forward will uh, ensure uh, this greater transparency and consistency of this impo very important part of the, the, the court uh, uh, process. Can I ask a, a Yes. Yeah, uh, can you also uh, give us assurances that the, to the current, uh, the current share of court auditors uh, will be retained to work under their present um, regulations and arrangements and until they choose to retire uh, or until they reach a specific age? Okay. Uh, in general terms, I mean, I'm not sure if the point is, is uh, to deal here with the issue of security of tenure because the auditor of the Court of Session has security of tenure and that, uh, that has been explained in, in the documents we put forward and they will remain in tenure until they, uh, they, they reach uh, 65, which I think is 2022, or until they decide to, to, to go earlier, if that is the case. Um, the, the position is not the same with regard to the Sheriff Court auditors, and for them, uh, they would be perfectly able to apply uh, to be uh, a salaried auditor in the, in the Scottish Court and Tribunal system, um, and uh, that would be an option open to them. Obviously, it won't happen overnight that we will be able to get these new auditors in place and trained up and in operation, so there will be a bit of breathing space, but uh, they will be entitled to apply to become a salaried uh, auditor. So there'll be some overlap, sorry, there'll be some overlap, therefore, until the system is... There will be, there'll be transitional provisions, yeah, yes, yeah. there will be, because we're dealing with existing situations and we have to reflect that in the work that we're doing here. So there will be transitional yeah. arrangements in place. Thank you, Convener. Ben McPherson. Thank you, Convener. Just as the Minister did, I remind uh, the committee that I am a registered Scottish solicitor. I, uh, good morning, Minister. I uh, just want to... Uh, bring a number of questions with regard to part four on group proceedings. Uh, we heard uh, a, a variety of evidence, particularly last week on, on this matter. Um, and uh, you touched on it at the beginning about the implementation of an opt-in uh, system being uh, more uh, e easier to, to, to implement and, and, and more efficient in, in the short to, to medium term, but with an openness to potentially uh, looking at an opt-out uh, in the future. Uh, initially, could you uh, perhaps explain why, uh, just in, in, in more, uh, give a further explanation as to why the Scottish Government has chosen to reject the option of an opt-out procedure at this stage? Okay, um, this has been a debate that's gone on for many decades, actually, group proceedings in Scotland, which I hadn't appreciated until I did all my homework. And it's, I think, 30 years, I think, I saw the figure being mentioned. So I think we're quite keen to make some progress. And to, to do that, um, it was felt that it would be more straightforward to start with opt-in. This is a new, a new procedure for the, the courts in Scotland. We don't have uh, group proceedings as such at the moment. So this would be entirely new. And we felt that the prudent course of action uh, the, the more pragmatic course of action would be to start with opt-in, which of course is more straightforward because there is a defined group of claimants, which is not the case with opt-out, uh, and to proceed on that basis. Um, I, I think it was Paul Burns of the Legal Services Agency who, who made the, the, the remark that whilst his preference would be opt-out, nonetheless, if it was going to take five years, he'd rather just start with opt-in so that we could make some progress with this. And I, I think that is you know, the, the, the driving our pragmatic approach to this, that it uh, is more straightforward to start with opt-in. Scotland is a smaller jurisdiction than some of the other uh, issues that have been raised uh, in, in reference to this issue by way of a comparison. Uh, and it would be straightforward to do that. There will be court rules that require to be drawn up and that is not a, an overnight process, um, but it would be more straightforward to have a package of court rules dealing with opt-in 
uh, uh, over a, a, a shorter period of time than to try to then come up with a package of rules for opt-in and opt-out uh, over, you know, that would take a, a much longer period of time in terms of looking at how long it has taken various court rules to, to, to arrive at final conclusion. Um, obviously, there would be a consultation. That would be, uh, there would be a consultation on those uh, court rules, uh, uh, so there would be an opportunity for, for, for people to comment. So that was really our thinking behind why we have uh, put forward the opt-in procedure at this point. And as the member says, I mean, in the fullness of time, absolutely keep the opt-out under review. But I think it's important to, to start somewhere and make progress on that basis. And that, that pragmatic management, I think, is, is very important. And um, I think what was striking in the evidence was that the, the opt-in procedure for communities is, is uh, clearly more accessible, but there may be an, an administrative burden um, when it comes to consumer and environmental cases. And uh, it's, it's reassuring that the government will, will keep an open mind on that going forward. And, but I, I agree that there was a welcoming of the, the opt-in procedure last week, as well as a, a, a sense of idealism that an opt-out in, in the longer term would, would be preferable. Um, witnesses also highlighted that uh, funding group proceedings uh, could be a problem uh, and can be a problem historically. Uh, could you comment on whether the, the Scottish Government has a plan to develop any support mechanisms in, in order to, to tackle this, uh, perhaps a, a specific fund? Well, I, I mean, the, the, the funding arrangements would be legal aid or success fees. That would be the, 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 the general approach. Uh, uh, and um, in terms of legal aid, obviously, there would be requirements to amend uh, current rules. And um, that would be something that, uh, I, that it may be that the Legal Aid Review currently ongoing uh, may have certain views on. Um, just going back briefly to the issue of um, the, the kind of general view about opt-in, opt-out, um, reading the evidence, it seems to me that every single stakeholder uh, 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 has supported opt-in, uh, including the Law Society of Scotland, which changed its mind. Uh, and the one that hasn't supported opt-in is um, the which organisation? and prefers opt-out. Um, so I think that's important that the, the weight of, of uh, stakeholder involvement suggests that they would, perhaps for pragmatic reasons, it's not maybe you know, how they would wish to proceed in the long term, but would accept proceeding with opt-in in, in, in the first instance. Indeed, and, and um, just uh, you mentioned as well earlier about the, the, the detailed rules on group proceedings. Um, and that these will be developed by the, the Scottish Civil Justice Council. Um, does the government have any control over this process at all going forward? Um, the control not as such because you know you've got the separation of the courts, but we have input in that. Uh, so the, on the Scottish Civil Justice Council and its you know its various subcommittees, if you like, um, we have representation. And indeed, on the Scottish Civil Justice Council, you have wider representation: government, consumers, others stakeholders, various stakeholders. So you have a, a fairly wide representation. And so we have input into the process, but we don't control it because we are uh, not, it's not really appropriate for us to control the, the courts as such because of the separation of powers. In, indeed, indeed. And, but just, uh, just I guess, to, to provide some reassurance to, to stakeholders and all of us in the interests of access to justice, um, given that there have been calls to develop a group proceedings element in, in Scots law for over 35 years. Um, and, but this is, this is when it's, it's happened and, and we all, uh, I'm sure, welcome that. Um, if the, the government doesn't have, as you said rightly, because of separation of powers, direct control over the process, uh, are you confident that this latest, latest initiative uh, won't be bogged down in detail or kicked into the long grass? Okay, on the, the latter point, um, I don't believe it would be kicked into long grass at all. I mean, I think people want this to happen, and there's a, now is seen as the moment in time that this should we should really get a shifty on here. And uh, sorry, that's not perhaps for the official report. <laughs> Take off. Um, so, but what we would do is we would issue, as we have done before, um, a policy note. Uh, so that would give you know a, a really a sort of clear idea of the government's uh, general sense of direction here and their thinking on that. And, you know, happy to reflect if on the face of the bill there may need to be, you know, some other language to that effect, um, just to give a, perhaps a, a clearer steer here. But absolutely, this is not going to be kicked into long grass. Um, we want this to happen, and I think the stakeholders want this to happen as well. 
Thank you, Minister. Uh -huh. Thank you. Can Liam you... Kerr, did you have a declaration? Yes, uh, forgive me, Minister. Just uh, before putting my questions, I intended to declare an interest as a solicitor with a current practicing certificate with the Law Society of England and Wales and the Law Society of Scotland. Yeah. Just one final question. Uh, Minister, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has raised concerns about the unusually wide scope of Section 7.4 of the Bill, uh, which would enable amendments to be made to Part 1 through secondary legislation. Could the Minister perhaps provide specific examples to explain why the modification of Part 1 under this Delegated Power would be necessary and proportionate? Okay, I, I think I can say that I, I'm aware that officials are aware of these issues. I don't know if you'd want to say something just now, Hamish, or perhaps we could write to the committee on this, perhaps more technical. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite technical. Quite technical. I'm getting advised it's quite technical, and if we could maybe write to the committee on that. Uh, fairly yeah, yeah, yeah. It's certainly of concern, the, the, the unusually wide. So, okay, we're um, happy to write to the committee convener. We'll do that in short happy order. Happy to, to, to receive that. Excellent. And there are no further questions. Therefore, that concludes our consideration of the bill. And I thank the, the minister and her officials for attending. Uh, that concludes our 34th meeting of 2017. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday 5th of December when we take closing evidence from the Minister on the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications repeal bill and consider a draft report on stage one of the civil litigation bill and also because we didn't complete the stage two amendments on the domestic bill uh, a domestic abuse bill will complete these um, on the 5th of December too. I now close this meeting of the Justice Committee.